Oh my god. Oh my god. Hey everyone, um, welcome to Artifact number 19. I'm joined today by uh, Joel Parrish. We're going to tackle Elizabeth Barrett Browning's Sonnets from the Portuguese. Um, and I'm actually also going to do a show with Jessica Schneider at the end of the year on Elizabeth Barrett Browning's uh, other kind of like major poetry collection, which is Aurora Lee. It's a novel in verse. Um, and sh she's a very uh, interesting poet. Uh, mostly because, first of all, she's extremely talented. Uh, the sonnets are, are some of the best uh, sonnet sequences around. Um, and so um, with uh, Elizabeth Bauer Browning, uh, one thing that needs to be said is, first of all, she gets her last name, obviously, from the poet Robert Browning, right? This was uh, her, her husband. Uh, Joe just uh, told me uh, a little bit earlier before I hit record that... Uh, uh, she was always kind of shy about her poetry. Right? She needed to be coaxed into kind of accepting not only the um, the idea to uh, publish the, these poems, but also the idea that they have any kind of uh, uh, worth, right? Um, that they're in any way kind of like worthwhile. And um, the reason why they're titled Sonnets from the Portuguese is because, you know, they're very kind of personal, right? They're dedicated to Robert Browning. And she didn't want uh, uh, people to sort of uh, have this impression that she was kind of writing love poetry to someone uh, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, you know, maybe just temperamentally, right? She's just kind of shy. So she kind of like pretended that she did a bunch of translations All of right. Portuguese poetry, um, which is, you know, it, it's it, it's interesting in the sense that like if, if you if you're a good poet, right, and you do something worthwhile, uh to kind of just hide your name and, and to kind of like forego the recognition for your own writing. You know, it, it, it's either you believe that because this is too personal to release to anyone, um, you might as well just kind of, you know, do, do this kind of like, you know, uh, fantasy uh, appearances um, or, you know, perhaps even with the coaxing, you know, perhaps she, you know, maybe did not even truly feel that, that these poems were, were worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, and, we, and we should say, so these were these were uh, written in the late 1840s, I believe. And I, I think they were published in maybe like 1850. Um, so this is this is around the time period, right? This is this is right around the time when we had uh, kind of like a, I, I think like the first kind of a sense that uh, modern poetry was going to be something very different, even, you know, from Shakespeare or, or John Donne, even if they had, you know, great poetry. Some of the stuff that you had coming out late 1700s, early 1800s onwards, right? Um, people like William Blake, right? Uh, William mm -hmm. Blake was uh, the, the the first, I think, like truly kind of like truly modern poet. Um, uh, sonnets from the Portuguese are an improvement on on Shakespeare sonnets, right? There's not a single like truly bad sonnet here, whereas Shakespeare had plenty, and you know most of them are just you know at, at minimum very good. And then we had you know names obviously like Walt women coming out so yep. she's right at this kind of a, a, a turning point right um which is an, an also kind of like interesting thing to think about it as you're reading through it because i i think you definitely get a sense of you know individual lines and thoughts that are tr you know truly truly modern right in the same w way that that blake is modern or, or whitman is modern mm -hmm. um not sure if you have anything to add about uh, uh elizabeth uh, browning or um you know, by way of introduction or, or what? I think that's all well said. And uh, first of all, I, they improved upon the title for these sonnets, I think, because it was originally called Sonnets Translated from the Bosnian. They were, uh, <laughs> she and Robert together, I think, were looking for something that would make them sound a bit exotic, a bit uh, from another place in time. And so uh, I do think Sonnets from the Portuguese has a a nice sound to it, a nice ring to it, uh, mm -hmm. compared to sonnets translated from the Bosnian. But I think you covered it well. And she, I think maybe people don't realize this all that much. She was quite prolific. You know, there's um, there's a 44 sonnets in this collection, but I have her collected poems. It's it's a thick volume, right? And yeah, uh, this so I'm this using her as well. In, yeah, this does not include Aurora Lee. So um, you know, that's uh, as you said, something you're going to talk about. Uh, it sounds like with Jessica, 
unto itself, uh, which is a, a a great work alone. So she wrote a lot of poetry. She's she's like you said, very much talented, and um, I think that. Maybe the the one thing that I would say by way of introduction on on these is that I think it's interesting that she made the decision to just go with the exact same form for every single sonnet. So the the rhyme scheme is the same, obviously, because they're sonnets, the the length is the same. But I think what readers and and viewers will latch on to as we go through here is that she she has a very nice way of... um, you know, it's the rhyme scheme's there, but it it doesn't always feel sing songy. It doesn't always feel uh, completely forced. In fact, sometimes when you read, I found myself on second and third readings, going back and and almost hunting for where the rhyme happened in a way because she she does a good job of capturing these moments, telling telling these stories or these moments uh, or expressing her feelings, and it's. Um, it, it's all it's all there. It's all well done. So I think it it gets a bit repetitive. There are times where I wish maybe she had gone with a more variety here. Maybe we can speculate a bit if we want later on why she kept the exact same form all the way throughout. But um, other than that, there's there is quite a bit of variety here. And in terms of a love love sonnet sequence, she covers a lot of ground. So I think that'll come through. Yeah. Um, so this is a collection. What is it? 44 sonnets. Yeah. 44 sonnets. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we chose like in, in between, uh, us, I think altogether now we're, we're dealing with something like 22, 23 poems. So about, about half of them, mm-hmm. right. Uh, a couple of them, you know, they do get kind of redundant. Some are clearly, uh, lesser, right. Uh, than others. Right. So we try to select some of the kind of, uh, best or, or more interesting or just, just revealing ones. Right. Because, um, although it's a sonnet sequence, like unlike Shakespeare sonnets, uh, th- there's very much like a kind of like internal world being built here. Yeah. Um, the sonnets talk to each other. The sonnets kind of like shed light, refract one another in different ways, reflect e- each other in different ways. And I mean, you definitely get that, for example, with, with John Donne with the Holy Sonnets, right? Um, he, he, he clearly, uh, has a kind of, uh, 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 you know, a uh, uh, a vision, a set of ideas that he's trying to impart, right? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, obviously, but um, here, you know, she she's tackling just the concept of love, right? And then you just wonder, you know, well, from how many directions can this be approached? And the answer is, you know, she she approaches it from from many different kinds of directions. She 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 does a lot, right? She um and like w- when we go through some of the individual ones, like some of them are, are almost kind of like you could have like one sonnet and then the uh, sonnet immediately following, or you know uh, maybe a couple sonnets later, they seem to be like part of the same unit. Mm-hmm. Right. And th- this this does enrich all of them. But sometimes it does happen that it comes a little bit at the expense of one or another, because you sometimes when she does like these like sonnet units, there's clearly one that is the sonnet around which everything revolves. Mm-hmm. Right. It's kind of like, you know, maybe the, the most powerful one. And then the other ones, even they're they're fine sonnets in their own right. You know, some of them uh, sometimes do feel a little bit like they're kind of like hanging on to. Uh, the kind of you know the, the 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 primary work or the primary unit and, and whatever like mini sequences she's doing in this kind of broader uh, macro sequence, um, but anyway, I mean there, there's a, a bunch of interesting stuff here, um, and and maybe we should just uh, get to it now. Um, yeah. I have actually so anybody that is that is watching this on YouTube, you could follow along with the text that is going to be in the video. If you guys are doing this through the audio podcast, again, this is available on pretty much whatever uh, podcast platform that you prefer to use. Um, You might have to either, uh, you know, hunt the poems for yourself so you can follow along or, you know, maybe follow along along with the words. But since these are um, poems, right, they are meant to be read, right? That's kind of, uh, I feel that's pretty important. So um, if you guys could follow along the screen, great. If not, you should probably pull up something on your phone or whatever else. You could find these on um, a project Gutenberg right here, uh, which is what I'm using now, right? Right. And we're Mm -hmm. starting with, so just to give people a sense 
right? These are, uh, they, they don't have individual titles, right? They are kind of, you know, they're titled by the first line. Um, right. And yeah, we're all, all the yeah. Roman numerals. Yeah. Yeah. And I was actually uh, looking at some, some Shakespeare stuff uh, earlier uh, this morning, just to do a little bit of comparison. And I mean, even, even with the first sign that we're going to start here, I'm starting with the first one because it is literally the most logical place to begin because it kind of, it's, it starts the idea off, right? It, it starts off the sequence. It presents the conceits. It shows you what she's trying to do. Whereas like, if you look at, you know, Shakespeare's first sonnet, you know, it, 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 it it might as well be, you know, sonnet number 54 or whatever, right? There's, there's no real coherence uh, in that way, right? Because, you know, I, I don't think he was sort of intending them as a sequence to begin with. But mm -hmm. even when you think about how, you know, poetry improves from century to century, I mean, one of the ideas would be, you know, can you actually formulate some sort of coherent and self-cohering sequence, Right, um, and and this is this is uh, what would would Browning wish to do here? Um, yeah. Anyway, I've been talking for a while. Do you do you want to just like start with uh, uh, this this poem, just reading it out, and maybe start with your analysis, and then I could jump in. Yeah, sounds good. So, sonnet number one. I thought once how Theocritus had sung of the sweet years, the dear and wished for years, who each one in a gracious hand appears to bear a gift for mortals, old or young. And as I mused it in his antique tongue, I saw in gradual vision through my tears, the sweet sad years, the melancholy years, those of my own life who by turns had flung a shadow across me. Straightway I was where, so weeping, how a mystic shape did move behind me and drew me backward by the hair. And a voice said in, in mastery while I strove, guess now who holds thee, death, I said. But there, the silver answer rang, not death, but love. So right away, just to comment on the technical side, we see that we've got this, this rhyme scheme. So A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, uh, what is it, C, D, C, C, D, C, D, yeah, it keeps going like that. So, you know, and she's, she's going to continue to echo this, um, like we said earlier, all the way throughout. But um, I, I think that right away in this first one, we do get a sense of what I mentioned earlier too, how this, this is a, a powerful series of images and, and some powerful storytelling that's going on here. Um, so the, the rhyme kind of heightens that, I think, uh, certainly in these first few poems, as you start to get a sense for what she's what she's aiming to do and what she's trying to accomplish um very nice repetons with the word years that certainly mm -hmm. stood out to me the very first time i read this and um uh, even it, as as you're like starting to get the feel that well, we know these are love poems before we start but um this doesn't in, in any way right here in the first several lines start like you'd expect a love poem to start really right mm -hmm. so we, we have a mention of you know, an older figure with Theocritus and talking about the sweet years, the dear and wished for years. Um, and, and so, you know, she's, she's talking about sweet, sad years, melancholy years, those are my own life. So it, it's feeling almost more like a confessional poem in a way, just about her own feelings. And uh, I really love this image too. those of my own life who by turns had flung a shadow across me. So uh, there, there's this dark, feeling that she's she's struggling she's going through something difficult maybe depressing um who knows and then there's this ominous feeling that that starts to take on in the you know the final piece of the poem here and this this voice this being that grabs her and she's in such a place that she's convinced it must be death and then we have this really nice inversion which then kicks off i think the whole rest of the sonnet sequence right as we go through so it's not death but it's love and so this the sense of foreboding and and maybe even tragedy that she's about to go through that turns out to be something completely different but it it is her way of commenting also on this this feeling that maybe this love she's experiencing is so so intense and so complex in a way that it, it could be mistaken for something else the way it's making her feel 
So uh, I think of really, really a, an excellent, potentially even great sonnet here that kicks off the entire sequence. And um, I'll stop there. I mean, feel free to to jump in. Beautiful music throughout as well, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I, yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed this particular sonnet. Yeah. Um, one thing that I would add here is, uh, um, so uh, like you mentioned, you, you don't get the sense at all, right, that this is supposed to be a love song, right? Mm -hmm. um, or, or rather like a, a love sonnet until, you know, the very end, right? We have all these lines and then it's only in the, in the final line, right? Literally mm -hmm. the 14th line that we have uh, love being invoked. And just, just a couple of things here. One thing that I, I found interesting, um, like when I was, for example, uh, uh, interviewing Ava Schubert, Schubert a couple of weeks ago, um, it, you know, some of her songs, right? There's this, uh, there are these kinds of like uncanny connections between like love and, and, and other things, right? And she has a song that connects love and death. Uh, mm -hmm. You have movies um, like Woody Allen's Love and Death. Uh, to me, you know, the, uh, the, the idea of connecting love and death is a lot more powerful and, and interesting than like the, the thing that comes to most people's minds, which is like the antonyms, right? Like love and hate or something. Right. Um, there is some kind of odd linkage, right? The uh, 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 love sort of like, you know, uh, ending with death in some ways. Uh, you have like different inversions historically with like love sort of enduring or persevering after death. Um, and, and, uh, the kind of, you know, melancholy that, that, uh, you know, the two concepts side by side might create. So mm -hmm. I've always found it to be a kind of interesting, perhaps like in some ways, counterintuitive connection, but also a connection that kind of captures, you know, what it is exactly, you know, when poets write and when artists create, um, it's, this is exactly the kind of tension that you want to be able to capture, right? You don't want to capture, uh, the tension of an antonym, right? You don't want to capture, um, you know, uh, uh, things that are kind of like very obvious, right? You want to, you want to capture stuff that by, by, by virtue of having poetic power, you know, these are connections that are not just immediately discernible. Um, another thing about the sonnet is just, how she she's she very much like begins the sonnet as, as a means of like world building mm -hmm. and in the world of uh, sonnets from the portuguese uh, part of that world building is presenting you know maybe you could say uh elizabeth Barrett browning herself you know there's like i think enough biographical information where you could make that sort of justification but even if you don't want to go there and bring biography into it there is a character right clearly in, in these uh, novel in these uh, sonnets um and this is a, a character that has a love it seems to be somewhat uh, constant throughout and it's a character that has again and again like this narrator has very similar preoccupations and um one thing that stands, stands out to me is the narrator again and again has this kind of odd relationship to, to melancholy where um, perhaps like she's a depressive type that yeah. doesn't necessarily even, you know, hate the depression, doesn't necessarily hate melancholy. Maybe there is a kind of, you know, craving for it. Maybe there is a sort of kind of sweetness to, to this melancholy. And you, you see this early on again with these, with these kinds of, um, you know, uh, 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 unconventional connections. So I thought of, uh, I thought once how Theocritus had sung of the sweet years, the dear and wished for years, right? These are things that human beings typically want. Mm -hmm. But as she repeats this later on, uh, I saw in gradual vision through my tears, the sweet, sad years, the melancholy years, right? She, she does have a kind of sweetness, right? She does associate a kind of sweetness with, with, with some of the melancholy that she feels, sure. right? This could be for many different reasons, but one thing that I've noticed in general with people that are, have a tendency towards uh, depression is, uh, th th there is, you know, there is a kind of craving that you could cultivate for it. Right, because it is so familiar, right? It is the thing that you are, uh, in some ways, m m most used to, and she's kind of like sp spelling this out here, right? Um, and you know, you would wonder, you know, what, why exactly is this being phrased in such a way, right? Um, 
And yeah, I think you could also say that um, maybe there's an appreciation on her part for that melancholy. You and I have talked about this before. Yeah. Where it is also a springboard into your art. Mm-hmm. So, you know, she's she's a poet of power and ability, and she's taking on something ambitious here, this long sonnet sequence that's ostensibly all about the same topic, quote unquote, of love. Mm-hmm. But she she is seeming to reflect here on in a way that that these melancholy years have given her uh, they've given her fodder they've given her things to talk about and it also plays nicely off of some of the um, feelings she's going to express about how this love is drawing her at times out of that melancholy it's something to celebrate as well so there's Mm -hmm. another juxtaposition that that we'll see as we go through and read more um but i I think that's probably part of it as well yeah and and one of the interesting things in the sequences, she never actually truly shakes off the melancholy, right? In fact, like the ideas of melancholy come back again and again. And, um, you know, even if she's sort of like being taken out of it, uh, there, there is this kind of like odd recognition throughout that objectively speaking, you know, there are things that you could put in a hierarchy. And she clearly, you know, understands that um, something like love is greater than than you know melancholy or an attachment to melancholy, and even that is sort of spelled out here in in, in this sonnet, right? So when when she's talking about this mystic shape, uh, so weeping how a mystic shape did move behind me, and drew me backward by the hair, right? Kind of like you know trying to shake her out through violence, through some sort of like discomfort, out of this like you know you know. Uh, a lot of like over melancholy, right? It's a kind of like, you know, self-obsession, right? It's a kind of like self-fixation. Even, even if the person can't help it, right? There's this kind of, you know, um, a fixation on the self and one's feelings. Mm-hmm. And here there's like a way to like, you know, get you out of that, right? Drew me backward by the hair. But like, watch this part. And a voice said in mastery while I strove. Guess now who holds these? So while, while I strove, like, what is she saying there exactly? Like, is she... Like, is she trying to resist, you know, this mm-hmm. pulling back? Is she trying to resist love, right? Um, I mean, literally here, she is resisting love. Yep. And in, in later sonnets, she she has a, a somewhat of a complex, not, not that she's rejecting love in any way, but she does have a somewhat complex relationship with it where perhaps she doesn't totally believe it. Perhaps yep. she does believe it in some level, but there's this still this kind of resistance in it, right? And, you know... Um, and, and like, it's just such an ambiguous phrase, right? While I strove, right? There's no like specific direction that that's being specified here. Um, there, there, there's nothing like that, but there's still that kind of unidirectional sense, right? There's still that image that you uh, uh, see, right? When you just imagine everything that was just described. And there's also that kind of, you know, almost metaphysical sense of, of what this in fact entails. Mm-hmm. Um I'm not sure if you have anything more to say about the sonnet, but if not, we can move on to uh, uh, the next uh, stuff that we have written down. Yeah, I think that's a, a good summation on number one. So let's go forward. All right. So the next one that we had uh, together was, um, or I'm not sure if we decided this together, but I, I wrote down number three. Yeah, I think um, number 13 was our next um, one that, that we overlapped on, but let, yeah. I mean, let's let's go through these other ones if if you uh think they're of worth so yeah so this is a sonnet uh number three so like the world has already been created uh, uh at least some of the characters have been set um and this is how she she continues some of this world building unlike are we unlike or oh princely heart unlike our uses and our destinies our ministering two angels look surprise on one another as they strike athwart their wings in passing. Thou, bethink thee, art a guest for queens to social pageantries, with the gauges from a hundred brighter eyes than tears even can make mine to play thy part of chief musician. What hast thou to do with looking from the lattice lights at me, a poor, tired, wandering singer, singing through the dark, and leaning up a cypress tree. The chrism is on thine head, on mine the dew, and death must dig the level where these agree. Um, So the first thing that stood out to me when I was reading this is uh, the fact that 
we could have like a double meaning, like by the time that we get to the second line, right? So it starts, unlike are we, unlike O Princely Heart, unlike our uses and our destinies. Um, on the one hand, you know, I think the most obvious comparison and and the or rather the contrast, uh, one that is kind of borne out by the end of the poem is uh the narrator is is comparing uh what she kind of herself wants or perhaps is in some way versus mm-hmm. what the heart is or or what the heart wants, right? Unlike our uses and our destinies. But yep. um it, another possible interpretation is that uh, uh, you and I, meaning you and I, the heart, right? There is some sort of camaraderie here, but what, you know, maybe society pushes on us or what other people want for us, or maybe what we uh, at at various times want for ourselves, uh, this is quite unlike uh, what our uses perhaps ought to be, what our destiny ought to be. Right. And, and as you read, you could actually, you know, you, you could do this like secondary, um, you know, interpretation and again, 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 and again, and it, it, you know, it does play out, play out in some ways, right. This is like something that you could, uh, uh keep in mind. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but she, she does, as the poem uh, goes on, she does try to like a little bit cement the, the first interpretation a little bit. Right. So are ministering to angels look surprised and one another as they strike athwart their wings in passing, Right. And it, I mean, it's an interesting image, right? You, you could just, great uh, image, yeah, yeah you, 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 you could see. Uh, so like when you say like a ministering angel, right. Uh, this almost has a little bit of that kind of modern view of like, you know, angel on the shoulder, you know, devil on the other shoulder kind of thing. Right. There's some kind of conflict rehears- between the two. They're looking at one another. Perhaps there is like a, a respect, you know, between them. Right. Um, they're not necessarily in, in open conflict. And, uh, this is brought out by they 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 look surprised on one another, right? They're not um they're they're not necessarily cohering in, in the same direction, right? Or perhaps they don't necessarily know what to do, right? As they uh, kind of watch each other from a distance, um, and then we get this part: Thou bethink thee, art a guest for queens to social pageantries, right? So if we're imagining that the narrator is speaking to the princely heart. You think yourself as a guest for queens, right, to social pageantries. And that's kind of like it's a little bit of a superficial kind of image, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, the narrator is never, you know, is never so concerned with outward uh, appearances. She's not so concerned with, uh, you know, the the kind of like trappings of of power or, or wealth or fame, right? So there's like a little bit of a, you know, looking askance at the heart here. Right. With gauges from a hundred brighter eyes than tears even can make mine to play thy part of chief musician. So gauges, uh, kind of, I guess, an archaic word uh, meaning um, some sort of like, you know, an object of guarantee, you know, Mm -hmm. some sort of seal or, you know, could be like a a, a jewel that is kind of, you know, given as a a promise of something, right? Different ways that you could uh, um, uh, interpret this. And then again, directing back to the heart, What hast thou to do with looking from the lattice lights at me, a poor, tired, wandering singer, singing through the dark and leaning up a cypress tree? And you're definitely getting the sense at this point that, like, even if the narrator is, you know, maybe maybe has like a little bit of a sense of, you know, uh, maybe these like superficial interactions that I'm kind of holding it at arm's distance um, you know, may, maybe there's something enjoyable about them. Maybe th- there's something to them. Uh, but also like this kind of, uh, and, and this, this is only kind of starting out, but you see this later on where, uh, this, this idea of, you know, like I said earlier, th- this hierarchy, right. Melancholy is lower than love later on. You get this idea again and again, that art is greater than both, right. Greater than melancholy, greater mm-hmm. than love. The greatest thing being, you know, some sort of artistic object that you could put at the very top, um, and you you start getting like almost like this the, the sense that beginning here, right? Like, am I, you know, really the the one to be pitied here, or are you to be pitied? And by the end, uh, the chrism is on thine head, on mine the dew, and death must dig the level where these agree, right? So ultimately, by the end, you know, she is kind of like pushing back more and more. 
against this idea of uh, of the princely heart. And you know, this is also kind of like beautiful, like almost like you know, like a you know, when you think of like the metaphysical poets, right? The the mm-hmm. overly logical, the kind of like you know, the um uh, the, the images that kind of like jump out at you. Um, th- th- this is one of those things, right? That is kind of like dependent on, on logic and understanding, uh, but, but also has, you know, um, j- j- just, just ha- has this sense of like something also a little bit more ineffable going on as well. Um, right. any- anyway, I feel like I talked enough about this one. Um, uh, yeah. if you well, want the, to take from here. Yeah. Yeah. The only other thing I'd maybe highlight on this one is, uh, right in the middle of the poem with thou bethink thee art a guest for queens the social pageantries with gauges from a hundred brighter eyes then tears even can make mine to play thy part of chief musician that stood out to me because once again we're we're early on here of course so we just did sonnet number one where she's and you talk about it here too that juxtaposition of the melancholy feelings um with just the the typical attitudes of the heart maybe or, or what it's good for what it's what it's used for, maybe what she perceives other people to use it for, right? Oh, the heart is just a, a means by which to uh, become a sap who can go play the harp or something at some social function. Um, but she's talking here that, you know, it, basically then tears even can make mine. So no matter how sad I might get, no matter how melancholy I might get, my eyes will never be uh, perceived to be as mm-hmm. bright as as yours are, you know, out mm-hmm. here playing your part of chief musician. So. Um, I just I think that's a, a nice setup of that kind of idea, and then um, yeah I mean the, the final line to me is is a, an excellent one and death must dig the level where these agree. First of all, it sounds kind of modern, I think, mm-hmm. right? It's, yeah. it's just sort of interesting language, especially when you frame it up against the the be- the rest of the poem, even the beginning. You know, this whole uh, seeing seeing oh something with an exclamation point at the end feels very like. 19th century right that's it feels yeah, like this, it's like even know. even like you know vocative you know latin or whatever right i mean right so un- yeah. unlike are we unlike oh princely heart it, it's got this setup of like ah you know this can be mawkish and not that great but then by by the end of it and death must dig the level where these agree it's um mm-hmm. it's a mysterious line it's it sounds kind of modern and it, it 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 continues to i mean i don't have really an answer in this moment for what exactly she means by that it, yeah it, part of why it's good it could be interpreted in a number of different ways so um yeah very very nice closing on this sonnet yeah well, one of the inter- i was also thinking you know what does she mean exactly by this well first of all like approaching a poetry with well what what does she mean exactly by this first of all that's wrong right but you you do mm-hmm. you know uh, you like there is oftentimes like a controlling belief or idea or whatever you know that, that a poet would uh, kind of invoke so um, it's not completely off the wall to try to get it out a little bit, uh, at least. And um, uh, the way that I interpret it is just building on the, this this uh, uh, idea of like the difference between the two. Um, so the chrism is on thy head, on mind to do, and death must dig the level where these agree. I, I took this as death being, you know, a leveling agent, time being a leveling agent for mm-hmm. just kind of ascribing worth to anything. Right. Um, whenever uh, uh, time passes, enough time passes. Like when it comes to like the arts, uh, only certain things get to be remembered. Only certain historical figures get to be remembered. Only certain things in general. Like even if you're not even looking uh, at artistic objects, um, mm-hmm. uh, only certain kinds of artistic objects tend to get remembered. Uh, um, so uh, this is the way that, that I uh, interpret it. Right. Kind of like. Uh, th- this idea that you know perhaps in the beginning she feels a little bit lesser than and by the end of it saying well you know irrespective of my melancholy my tears or whatever it's not really going to be up to you or me or even the queens right at these social mm-hmm. pageantries to make these determinations it's going to be time that's going to make this determination it's going to be death that's going to you know uh, make this make this determination and you know so much so much of these poems they 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 tend towards this idea of you know reaching some kind of you know objective measure of something right it's not exact you know obviously one of those things could be in the artistic sphere but there there's always this kind of like striving for some kind of objectivity like beyond the self right mm-hmm. so Anyway, 
Um, the, the, the next poem that we have is, uh, well, it's also one that I selected. I, I don't think you selected number 12, but um, uh, number 12 is what I wrote down to discuss as well. Um, mm -hmm. Here we are. Do you, do you want to take that one? Sure. I can read it. So sonnet number 12. Indeed, this very love, which is my boast, and which, when rising up from breast to brow, doth crown me with a ruby large and owl, to draw men's eyes and prove the inner cost. This love even, all my worth to the uttermost, I should not love withal, unless that thou hadst set me an example, shown me how, when first thine earnest eyes with mine were crossed, and love called love. And thus I cannot speak of love even as a good thing of my own. Thy soul hath snatched up mine all faint and weak, and placed it by thee on a golden throne, and that I love, O soul, we must be meek, is by thee only, whom I love alone. So uh, this, this one, it, for me, it's, it's a little bit tougher because there's so many these and thous, and, you know, some of the, the language is uh, mm -hmm. a bit more of that archaic language, but um, you know, I, th I think maybe, I'll be curious to hear what you have to say about this one. Um, I, I think that there are good images here, maybe a couple that are clunky, you know, when first thine earnest eyes with mine were crossed and love called love. I mean, I, I know she's talking about them both realizing they're in love with each other there, but, um, she, she maybe could have improved upon that some, but the, the, the whole idea, the interesting one here being that um, you know, she's, she's still at the end of this poem, you know, oh, solely must be meek is by the only whom I love alone. So this idea that if it weren't for, in her case, Robert Browning, uh, maybe she wouldn't love anyone or anything. This is, un it's a unique love between the two of them that she wants to talk about, um, and, and even boast about, right? So by now, I mean, we start out with kind of in the first couple of sonnets we just highlighted she's wrestling even with the idea of the heart versus her melancholy of identifying and accepting any of these feelings and now by sonnet 12 she's boasting about this love but um you know and, and there's even a crowning with a ruby large enough to to draw people's eyes and and talk about you know talk about a change in, in her attitude right it's almost like she in a certain sense, wants this attention. She now wants to, to uh, talk about and project out this love. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's all I probably really have to say about this one. I, I didn't I didn't highlight it, so I didn't perceive it to be one of the strongest from the collection. But what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I agree. It's actually not uh, one of the strongest. Uh, it, it is one of the, one of the weaker sonnets. Uh, the main reason why I highlight it is because it does form a kind of unit with sonnet number 13 which uh, both of us did highlight to discuss specifically because it's, it's a very strong sonnet mm -hmm. um but uh yeah like i, I mean with some of the kind of like uh, uh i'm not sure if i'd call them uh, clunky images but kind of like a little bit more trite you know placed it by thee on a golden throne right that's a very kind of conventional way of, of getting at uh what she's trying to get at mm -hmm. um but even so, I mean, you, you do have some interesting stuff here, right? When first thine earnest eyes with mine were crossed and love uh, called love. Uh, and then by the end of it, right, um, there is some ambiguity in terms of exactly what she means, right? And that I love, uh, oh soul, we must be meek, is by thee only, whom I love alone, right? Th th this word alone, right, this this could be um, uh, an you know, it, it, an adverb just describing the idea that uh, I, you know, I am the only one that loves you, right? Uh, or perhaps like I love uh, oftentimes like even within my own aloneness, right? Again, mm -hmm. you know, if, if we're thinking of this as a sonnet sequence, right? Because it's not, you know, it's not totally appropriate to just like isolate these one by one. We have like a character, right? And she seems to be you know, a complex character, right? She's, uh, she goes through changes, but in other ways, she's also kind of consistent. Um, you, you, you still could sort of uh, interpret this uh, in the sense of uh, uh, there is this kind of still this recurring aloneness and, and perhaps even like a loneliness that she must um, contend with. But beyond that, I don't have, I don't have too much 
uh, to say, I did appreciate this word and now, right? It's not a word yep. that I had uh, heard before, right? And it's, um, you know, it, it's a n- nice way of, of getting uh, the idea of enough in while keeping the, the rhyme and still, you know, uh, doing it in a way where like, you, like when I read, it, I immediately knew what the word meant. But yeah. it, it, even though I had never seen it before, um, so, you know, in, in that way, like, you know, as time passed, it still remains kind of clever that an educated reader could still get enough without having to go to the dictionary, right? Just by kind of feeling it out um, in, in the sense. But anyway, I, I'm just viewing uh, uh, Sonnet 12 as a kind of like stepping stone, stone to Sonnet 13, right? As mm-hmm. part of that, that unit. So uh, Sonnet 13, which again, we both highlighted as, uh, as especially strong. And wilt thou have me fashion into speech the love I bear thee, right? So just before I just read the whole uh, sonnet, right? It starts with this and, and this actually happens a lot, right? We have this, um, uh, yeah. uh, it's kind of like, you know, uh, it, it, it's starting like in the middle of something, almost like continuing a thought. And the thought that's being continued is the thought that we have here. Right. right. She's describing this love. Right. And now it's, it's as if like Browning or whoever the, the person being spoken to is asking for this love to be somehow kind of specified or written down. And this is how uh, the narrator n- narrator responds. And wilt thou have me fashion into speech the love I bear thee, finding words enough and hold the torch out while the winds are rough between our faces to cast light on each. I drop it at thy feet. I cannot teach my hand to hold my spirit so far off from myself, me, that I should bring thee proof in words of love hid in me out of reach. Nay, let the silence of my womanhood commend my woman love to thy belief, seeing that I stand on one, however wooed, and rend the garment of my life in brief by a most dauntless, voiceless fortitude, lest one touch of this heart convey its grief. Um, since since we both uh, uh, wrote this one down, well, what is what is the reason for um, uh, wanting to discuss this on in your eyes? Yeah, so I, there's a, a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, again, I praise her here because this is a more it's a sonnet that sounds ahead of its time. It, mm-hmm. it sounds modern to me, not just in the fact that there's less of the the old old English or old romantic style language, but just the, the images used and, and the way that this moves along, it's, um, there's a lot packed in here, but I, I still think it moves along breezily. I also think that this is one of the poems from the whole sequence where the rhyme scheme works very nicely. Mm. Um, so, you know, when, when we look at the rhymes that she's making, um, the the enjambment of them and, and the way that it all hits the reader and kind of cascades down, I think is very strong. One of, one of the strongest. Um, I also, you know, again, this is one of her, her techniques or, or her hallmarks is to, to kind of play with, with some repetons here. Um, I thought that nay, let the silence of my womanhood commend my woman love to thy, by thy belief, womanhood and woman love. Um, it's, it's an interesting thought, you know, her talking about woman love specifically, uh, you know, what, what is it now? She's, it's not just love, it's woman love to thy belief. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. I don't know that I have a specific answer on why she'd phrase it that way, but I, I think that's a nice Mm -hmm. Uh, powerful repeton there but yeah i mean even just from the very beginning like you said this continuation from number 12 and so she's in number 12 you know she had been talking about continuing to uh the soul must be meek but then she's like well let me try you know will will you have me fashion it into speech the love Mm -hmm. i bear thee finding words enough and hold the torch out while the winds winds are rough between our faces to cast light on each and so you know it's there's kind of this powerful image, I guess in my mind, I had like this, you know, maybe it's like dusk or nighttime and they're, the two of them are standing there and there's just this torchlight between their faces. But then she, I drop it at thy feet. I cannot teach my hand to hold my spirit so far off from myself. So this feeling that she has is strong enough that something like a torch where she's holding it out 
is not sufficient. Um, she, she, she needs these spirits, these feelings to be, to, to still be within herself in a way, mm -hmm. which I just think is, it's all a very interesting setup, you know, to put it outside of herself, but say, I can't do that. I actually have to, I should bring the proof and words of love hid in me out of reach. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, just, just some strong ideas here. I, I really think it's a, a brilliant sonnet. What do you think? Yeah. So, I mean, like, first of all, like with, with the fire imagery, right. I mean, uh, it's, it's actually a very common to have a uh, fire being connected in some way to love or to sex, right. This is like, you know, you find this, you find this in like the Aeneid, right. You find this in Homer, this is like ancient mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but here, you know, it's, it's done. Fresh, for, yeah. yeah, here yeah. it's done for a very different reason, right? Here, the fire is not like the burning passion of like whatever the fuck, right? This is, yeah. um, th 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 this is about like purely illumination, right? Mm -hmm. The love I bear thee, finding words enough, and hold the torch out while the winds are rough, right? When you think about the winds being rough, right? And she's trying to communicate love. Perhaps this is an indication that she feels like she's not able to do this love justice via words. You know, perhaps it means something else, but this is one possible interpretation, right? So hold the torch out between our faces to cast light on each, right? She's basically saying that, um, you know, the illumination that I can provide might be insufficient, right? Or at least that's, mm -hmm. that's one of the interpretations that you could give. Uh, which is why, therefore, I drop it at thy feet. I cannot teach my hand to hold my spirits so far off from myself, me, that I should bring thee proof in words. So, again, like, you know, going back earlier, like I, 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 I said this before, where um, there is this kind of recurring sense that she's trying to get beyond the subjective self, subjective feelings, uh, self-fixation into you know uh, some more objective territory she tries to do this in multiple sonnets again and again this is like she, she obviously references love a lot but but this but but you know th this in many ways is you know this is a, as much as one of the tensions in these poems as as, as love or as anything else right you know mm -hmm. it, it's not just love poetry it is very much this kind of you know how how can i conquer the self and of course like in, in this kind of worldview Conquering the self is just a matter of uh, understanding the self objectively, objectifying the self against the world, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, and you know, uh, but you know, you, you picked up on that as well as you were reading it. Um, and, and this is the next part. So nay, let the silence of my womanhood commend my woman love to thy belief, seeing that I stand on one, however wooed. Uh, I, I took I, I took uh, the distinction between womanhood and woman love to be one of um, ju just this kind of a distinction between what she wants versus uh, perhaps her pride, right? Hmm. When you think of yeah. like womanhood invoked in this way in older poetry or like older writing in general, sometimes it's like a, a reference to virginity. Um, mm -hmm. Even if it's not a reference to virginity, it could very well be a reference to you know, the stereotypical kind of like, you know, female stubbornness about sex, which is no, 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 you know, like compared to the stereotypical male stubbornness about sex, which is yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, you know, th there's a tension here, right? There's that womanhood of pride, of personal pride of, I need to perhaps appear a certain way or feel a certain way or do things a certain way because these are social expectations, versus the woman love which is you know this is the objective thing you know the womanhood is is you know it's all it's all the subjective judgments of the world the woman love is what actually is being felt this is the thing that she recognizes you know in, in the person that she's speaking to um we don't even have to say browning but like you know uh, whoever right um uh because again like you know seeing that i stand on one however wooed right there's still this point of pride here right there's still this idea that, um, you know, perhaps you're doing a good job, but s something more needs to be done, right, for me to be fully one, even if such a thing is totally possible. Because, again, I'm, I'm not even so sure that by the end of the, the sequence, like, even if there's clear love between the narrator and, and, and the person that she's speaking to, um, there's, there's still a complicated approach to love. 
And uh, Dan Schneider mentioned uh, before about um, he made this like offhand comment about like the the, the ways that uh, Elizabeth Elizabeth Barrett Browning represents you know a kind of um, you know a, a proto feminism and the kind of feminism that you know modern feminism should you know even be striving towards, but it's done in like subtle ways like this, mm-hmm. right? Um, and and you know you you also wonder like well w- why is it that you would think that someone like Elizabeth Browning would be one of the most popular figures for like, I don't know, feminist critics or, you know, um, uh, female like readers of poetry from today that are constantly, you know, talking about like, why isn't there sufficient representation of women in the arts, so on and so forth. You would think right. that one of the people that ought to be represented in these discussions is, is Elizabeth Browning and she's not right. Mm-hmm. She's still like, like, at, like during her lifetime, her her books, like I think Aurora Lee had something like twenty different editions, like during her life, and it took like another century, like after she died, for there to be another edition of the book, right? Which is yeah. which is kind of crazy, you know? Like for whatever reason, um, she has been ignored by feminist criticism. I, I think part of it honestly has to do with how much time and energy gets expended on what seems like ostensibly like you know, a typical like male, female courtship, maybe that's considered kind of like, you know, corny, maybe it's just considered like, that's not, you know, what women ought to be focusing on, but you mm-hmm. know, whatever the idea might be, you know, this is a much more complicated look on something like love right. than even like modern, you know, like even like most modern, uh, you know, women writers that would consider themselves feminist writers, you know, most of them by definition would not be able to write in such complicated fashion about, you know, like hokey subjects like love, right? Uh, uh, Because, you know, by definition, you know, like someone like Brown, it comes along only every once in a while, right? So most, most people can't be in that category. So anyway, I I agree that this is one of the, um, uh, one of the best sonnets uh, in in this uh, sequence. I would also call it a, a, a great sonnet. Um, just very well done all around fits very nicely with, with what she does and and so much else. And, uh, you know, even as a kind of, like I I said earlier that oftentimes you have like a structural units that are formed where you have like a, a, it starts with a weak link uh, or rather it starts with a strong link, then everything else kind of like a hanger on, but here it's kind of the opposite. We kind of have like a little bit of a weaker setup here and then we have like a a payoff, right. Um, on, on sonnet 13, um, do you want to, do you want to take, take, the, or, or do you want to add something more or what? No, well, I was going to say, but then uh, you also highlighted number 14. So you had these three in a run. I, I think my next one was 15. Do you want to look at 14 quick and just see how this continues? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, if we're, if we're here, we might as well do 12, 13, 14, 15 to kind of see how yeah. it ebbs and flows. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if this is necessarily part of the same unit, but I mean, it, it, it could be right to some extent, all of these cohere in some way. Um, but let, let, let's just, uh, see. So, um, sign at 14. If thou must love me, let it be for naught except for love's sake only. Do not say I love her for her smile, her look, her way of speaking gently for a trick of thought that falls in well with mine, and certes brought a sense of pleasant ease on such a day. For these things in themselves, beloved, may be changed or changed for thee, and love so wrought may be unwrought so. Neither love me for thine own dear pities wiping my cheeks dry. A creature might forget to weep who bore thy comfort long and lose thy love thereby. But love me for love's sake, that evermore thou mayst love on through love's eternity. Um, so, uh, I mean, in terms of continuation, right? We have uh, starting with uh, um, uh, this this uh, th- this this idea of I cannot speak of love, right? Uh, it can only be through you. To hear, kind of like pushing back against verbalizing this love, then maybe kind of like um uh being wooed not just romantically like wooed into like you know sex or whatever but having the poetry and the verbalization coaxed out of her Mm -hmm. right and then uh a kind of like chiding uh, uh, of the lover that uh uh, do not love me for these kinds of 
you know, for, for these things that can disappear, right? I mean, like the, the way that she phrased it at the beginning was, I love her for her smile, her look, her way of speaking gently. Like everybody yeah. says this, right? Everybody has, you know, whether you got a boyfriend or girlfriend, whoever, everybody has like little, you know, like bits and pieces that are, that are special to you, right? And, and she's kind of like pushing back against this idea that this is not something that builds a lasting relationship, right? Or I love her for a trick of thought that falls in well with mine. And this is interesting because now we're getting to territory where actually like love can be formed in a more permanent basis on things like a trick of thought. Like, and you start wondering, okay, so if we're treating, you know, her as a character or the narrator as a character, what can you say about a character that on the one hand is kind of like skeptical of love to begin with a little bit for different reasons and in different ways to one that then says something like for a trick of thought that falls in well with mine, like she calls like intellectual camaraderie, a mere trick of thought. And to me, like, I don't consider that a trick of thought. I mm-hmm. think it's important right. to be able to, you know, have like uh, uh, someone, someone that you know you're in love with, to be able to like sit, watch movies with, you know, read poetry with, read books with, that you could like both understand in similar fashion. You know, that that is kind of important, right? But she kind of denigrates this down to a trick of thought that falls in well with mine, mm-hmm. right? Um, well, and, 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 yeah, and, don't, and but the next part is kind of deflationary, like in a different way, because like a sense of pleasant ease in such a day, that's also kind of, you know, throwaway, right? Like you, you don't want a relationship based on that either, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, but then, so I, I, I agree with what you're saying there. And after that, um, speaking a little bit as well, maybe to your, your point about her um, sense of personhood and it, that, that she should probably be more of a champion of feminists uh, than she is. I mean, these are powerful words where she says, for these things in themselves, beloved, may be changed or change for thee. Mm-hmm. So she's speaking about the fact that, hey, I have the capacity to change. You know, you might love, first of all, physically, you might love my look or my smile. And what, you know, obviously those are guaranteed to change over mm-hmm. time. So don't, don't capture me, you know, uh, like photographically in your mind, looking young and beautiful today, and then rely on that forever, which is, you know, it's not the deepest thing to say, of course, but it, it is interesting that she, that she brings that out here. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in a way like has the, the courage to say that. Um, but then also, you know, she's saying it, they could change for thee, right? You, you could mm-hmm. just change your mind someday, right? Where, all of a sudden, I, I don't look, um, you know, quite as appealing as I used to, or something like that. And love so wrought, maybe unwrought. So, just a very nice poetical turn of phrase, right there. Right, this is what poets can do. Uh, this is what mm-hmm. poetry can do that that other forms of writing can't do so well. Uh, it's just so much is said right there in that little, you know, basically one full line, if you were to put it all together. But I, I really do enjoy that phrase and love so rot, maybe unrot. So the same thing that put it together might take it apart kind mm-hmm. of idea. Um, and, uh, and, and even this line, I mean, she's got a little bit of humor in here too. Yeah. Neither love me for thine own dear pities, weeping my cheeks dry. Oh, by the way, a creature might forget to weep who bore thy comfort long and lose thy love thereby. That kind of idea that familiarity yeah. breeds contempt. But, um, you know, she says it in a creative and, and, an interesting way there. And there's a bit of humor to it. But then she closes again on this, but love me for love's sake, that evermore they, thou mayst love on through love's eternity. Um, so, so praising the, the virtue of, uh, of love as a, a practice or an idea, I guess. But um, anyway, I, I, don't, I didn't highlight this one because I, I don't think there's quite enough here to, to put into the upper echelon from these 44. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I mean, the reader can see still a good sonnet, no question. You know? Yeah, and also just that, touching on this uh, next part of me. So, so some of the cleverness is also, so uh, neither love me for thine own dear pities, wiping my cheeks dry. A creature might forget to weep who bore thy comfort long and lose thy love thereby. Basically like the cleverness comes in where uh, she's also kind of, you know, praising the love, you know, of the lover, right? Uh, that, well, look, you know, you met me. I was, you know, perhaps like depressed or I had other things going on. And by being comforted through your love, uh, 
I have forgotten to cry, right? I don't have to cry anymore. And simply because now you first, you know, uh, sought me and found me while I was a crier. And now after creating all these comforts for me now, since you've, you know, eliminated the reasons for my crying, am I now simply going to lose your love because of that? That doesn't make mm-hmm. any sense. Right. So yeah, it's, it's like both humor and it's also, you know, just like all, all around cleverness. Um, mm-hmm. And I mean, like the, 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 the last two lines are are a little bit weak, right? Simply because they're kind of commonplace, right? But love me for love's sake that evermore thou mayst love on through love's eternity. Um, Maybe not in this same exact kind of combination of words, but we've seen enough, you know, stuff up until this point in, in, in poetry writing, right? You know, through like, let's say 1850, when this was published, that uh, the, the, some of these phrasings are kind of commonplace. And uh, I mean, you could invert some of these commonplaces, like when Robinson Jeffers has that uh, a poem, the, um, the uh, what is it, the, the house dog's grave, yeah. um, where it, it does seem to end in some commonplaces, but given that it's uh, also has other inversions, it's also from the perspective of a dog, it's, it's much easier to rationalize, um, it's much easier to explain, uh, this makes it a little bit weaker, but you know, yeah, also, well, even, yeah, I was just going to say, even in that poem, uh, if you're going to use that as an example, yeah, Jeffers has an, an interesting idea where, you know, she here is talking about love's eternity, but Jeffers talks about how deep love endures to the end and far past the end, mm-hmm. uh, which is just a, yeah, it's, it's something that makes you think, right. You know, everyone's kind of accustomed to, yeah, deep love endures forever. It endures to the end, but he says, and far past the end, whatever that means, you know, what, mm-hmm. what does yeah. that mean? It's a different phrasing of eternity or a different conception yeah. of what eternity might even be. She just goes with eternity here. You know, it's, it's weaker for that reason, but yeah. Anyway. Um, so what's that? Oh, I also have 15. Is that what I wrote down? 15 as well. Yeah. We, we both had 15, I believe. Highly. Okay. Or no, I did. Sorry, I did, and you did okay. not. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Interesting. Um. All right. So, I yeah, I would have considered fifteen or fourteen to be part of the same kind of like smaller unit, but mm-hmm. um, maybe you could maybe you could take it from here. Okay. Yeah. So fifteen. Accuse me not. Beseech thee that I wear too calm and sad a face in front of thine. For we too look two ways and cannot shine with the same sunlight on our brow and hair. On me thou lookest with no doubting care, as on a bee shut in a crystalline. Since sorrow hath shut me safe in love's divine, and to spread wing and fly in the outer air were most impossible failure if I strove to fail so. But I look on thee, on thee, beholding besides love the end of love hearing oblivion beyond memory as one who sits and gazes from above over the rivers to the bitter sea. So uh, speaking of Jeffers, I I think I was probably reminded of Jeffers a bit reading this, this poem of hers uh, talking about things like oblivion and gazing from above and rivers and the bitter sea. Um, There's definitely that there, you know, this is kind of a nice intertwining of a, a nature poem with a love you know, continuing this idea of love a little bit. Um, so again, in the beginning of this one, I think it stood out to me that in a, in a two lines, she does a nice job of talking about how different they are. You know, um, accuse me not that I wear too calm and sad a face in front of thine, for we two look two ways and cannot shine with the same sunlight on our brow and hair. So even if the the same sun is hitting us, we're not the same. You know, mm-hmm. it's uh, it, it, we're different people. So this is um, naturally going to to show differently on both of us. I think it's a, a nice way to frame that up. On me thou lookest with no doubting care, as on a bee shut in a crystalline, since, shor- since sorrow hath shut me safe in love's divine, and to spread wing and fly in the outer air, were most impossible failure if I strove to fail so. I get a little bit lost in those lines, if I'm being honest. I don't know if you can, um, they sound beautiful. I don't. I don't necessarily know exactly what she's, what she's trying to to articulate or say there? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, well, um, just in general, I, I would uh, when I say that Browning is, um, you know, she's full of very kind of like you know complex interpretations of love. This is definitely 
Um, originally, when I was ri- reading these, I actually circled this poem and folded, you know, the, the page, your dog ear di- to discuss yeah. it. I'm not sure why, why I didn't send it along, but this also would have been a, a poem that both of us would have selected. Mm-hmm. Um, so like in terms of like a, a complex uh, look on love, uh, I mean, j- 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 just th- so, so first of all, like, you could imagine a situation where, you know, if she's, uh, if this is a character that is kind of given to depressive moods, you could imagine the lover kind of like walking by, like on a beautiful day together, taking a nice walk and then saying like, ah, oh, why are you so fucking depressed? Like, why aren't you happy? <laughs> why aren't you happy right now? Be happy, be happy, smile, smile, smile. Um, and, and, you know, she starts out as a response to that, accuse me not beseech you that I wear too calm and sad a face in front of thine. For we two look two ways and cannot shine with the same sunlight on our brow and hair. Right. So she's basically saying that the, you know, a lot of these like subjective feelings, this isn't necessarily, you know, a a comment on you. This Mm -hmm. isn't even a comment on me. This is something that is oftentimes, you know, beyond our control. And yet, you know, the image that she chooses, we cannot shine with the same sunlight on our brow and hair. There is like, there is something um, powerful here, right? This is an image of something positive, right? This is an image of of, of something that is uh, illuminating, right? It's not enough to say that, oh, look, you're walking with me and you're happy and I'm not. So therefore you have the proper take on events here and I don't. She's basically saying that we're here from two different sets of feelings, two different sense, set, sets of point of views, even if we differ in this or that way, we could still come together to some sort of, you know, greater understanding, even if it's not necessarily a mutual understanding. And this idea of, again, sunlight, this, you know, illumination, right? She's not, you know, like this, this is one of one of the poems where she's kind of you know, uh, I don't want to say that she's like praising her melancholy because she doesn't ever truly do that. But uh, it's it, it's a poem where melancholy, again, comes back with a sense of it being kind of a uh, sweet and love, though, is given a, a more kind of ambiguous treatment. So like on me, thou lookest with no doubt and care as in a bee shut in a crystalline. Right. I mean, so like the like the lover is a bee shut in a crystalline. This, this is, on the one hand, a very kind of arresting image in the sense that it's a little bit negative, right? You, uh-huh. you, you don't want to think of yourself or anyone, you know, in these terms. Um, but also, like, there is something kind of, like, beautiful about it. I mean, we have those, like, amber, you know, insects that people sell or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there, there is, like, something powerful and timeless uh, something like that is like worthy of examination, right? In this kind of image, right? But but it is, you know, there is also this undercurrent of ambiguity here, right? And then uh, what you were asking about, so since sorrow hath shut me safe in love's divine, again, this idea of safety is not necessarily, you know, the, the word safe sounds positive. I'm not convinced that in this poem, it's necessarily all that positive though. So right. since sorrow hath shut me safe in love's divine, and to spread wing and fly in the outer air were most impossible failure if I strove to fail so. So she's basically saying that essentially trapped in love, trapped in your protection, perhaps even trapped in your like almost aggressive, like, why don't you smile more type of shit that starts at the beginning. Um, you know, uh, I, I I cannot, you know, spread my wings and fly. And this is this is also like this is kind of like a commonplace image. And yet, in the context of everything else, this is an, a, a very much an inverted cliche, right? Big to time. spread yeah. wing and fly in the outer air were most impossible failure. If I strove to fail, so so um, the so so she's kind of like casting doubt that she even wants to escape this crystalline, right? Mm-hmm. That she wants to escape uh, the, the safety, but also the possibility that, you know, perhaps, you know, she might want to do that, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's one of those things where, again, uh, even if love as an objective good is appreciated, the ambiguity comes in with like this feeling of there is a little bit of, of an oppression right there. Um, and maybe we should have like mentioned this earlier to the audience, like not everybody really, you know, maybe we should have described like what a sonnet is like usually a 14 line poem, 
But the important thing about a, a sonnet is it's 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 split into uh, the first um, uh, uh, eight lines, right? Oh, right? Wait, where are we? Three? Yeah, the first eight lines that has some sort of special relationship with the last six. And mm-hmm. this last six could be an inversion. It could be a refraction. It could be a reflection. It could be an intensification of the argument in the first eight lines. It could be a rejection of the argument in the first eight lines. There's all, all sorts of things you could do with it, right? So we have this like ambiguity, right? In the first eight, right? Where most impo- possible failure, if I strove to fail so. So this is where like the ambiguity really is kind of like crystallized, right? It comes to the fore. Right. I have the possibility of trying to escape, but you know, what why would I? Right. But still that kind of possibility is always in the background. But I look on the on the beholding besides love, the end of love. Right. This is like again, objectifying beyond the self, beyond like your own kind of, you know, self-obsessions, hearing oblivion beyond memory. Again, like a complete complete obliteration of the self mm-hmm. as one who sits and gazes from above over the rivers to the bitter sea, right? And if you think about like a, a perfect kind of like, you know, rejection of, of subjectivity, uh, th- I mean, this could be like someone sitting at a precipice in a cliff or something, but it could all be an angel. It could be some other kind of figure. Um, it could be something else entirely, right? This is, uh, uh, it, it feels like much more, like this being like the most kind of objective look at the events of the previous 12 lines. Anyway, that's the way that I would interpret. I'm not sure if that- yeah. Uh, helps or or what, but uh, that's the way that I would look at it. Yeah, I think that's good. And then uh, just rereading it a couple more times while you've been going through these lines and and commenting on it, I do think what you highlighted a couple minutes ago with the inversion of since sorrow has shut me safe and love's divine and to spread wing and fly in the outer air were most impossible failure if I strove to fail. So that's hitting me harder every minute in terms of how excellent of an inversion that Mm -hmm. is, right? Because in in most people's conception of of love poetry even poetry period just expressing some kind of triumphant emotion spreading wings and flying is about as cliched as it gets right mm-hmm. you know that's uh it's just so typical um and you know even even for that to be in the context of a bee who's shut in a crystalline rather than a, a bird in any way mm-hmm. right there there's no there's no bird imagery here um so again, it's it's just she she makes like such excellent choices as far as this goes um, to to both express what she's feeling, but also force the the reader to think uh, quite deeply about what she's saying here and and kind of uh, reframe in your mind what mm-hmm. you see in front of you. So um, anyway, yeah, I, I think that's why I highlighted this one. There's there's a lot there. Um, for, for again, just like you said, a fourteen-line sonnet, not a long poem. It's yeah, I, 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 well I, I yeah, I, I would say that this is also one of those like truly great sonnets in the sequence, right? I, I would mm-hmm. say this is definitely a, a great sonnet. Um, you know, going beyond like mere technical uh, excellence, there's just there, there's too much going on here for this not to be the case. On top of like you know already the kind of like manifest technical excellence that this poem has, right? Um. All right, what was the next one in line here? I think you had 17 and then we both had 18 highlighted. Yeah. So um yeah, so uh sonnet 17. My poet, thou canst touch on all the notes God set between his after and before, and strike up and strike off the general roar of the rushing worlds, a melody that floats in a serene air purely antidotes of medicated music answering for mankind's forlornest uses thou canst pour from thence into their ears god's will devotes thine to such ends and mine to wait on thine how dearest wilt thou have me for most use a hope to sing by gladly or a fine sad memory with thy songs to interfuse a shade in which to sing of palm or pine a grave on which to rest from singing choose um so like the, the first thing that that uh, uh stood out to me was like at the beginning my poet thou canst touch and all the notes got said between his after and before so like if you just 
think about this in a purely literal sense. Okay, God set between his after and before. So what is God's before? God's before, um, uh, I don't think she'd be, you know, saying that uh, there is like a, a something before God, right? Uh, I think kind of like the ideas, especially at the time, was that God is, you know, always kind of like self-created and always existing. Mm-hmm. Um, so perhaps the the before refers to like the, the creation of the universe. So the notes that God set before, let's call it some sort of like, you know, generalized creation and after the creation, right? Um, yeah. But we're like, what is in between? Is it like that singularity point that we might talk about in physics? Is it something else? Because uh, like it, it's it's interesting because like even um like even if you like want to bring like modern physics like like concepts of like you know like the Big Bang like or whatever like starting with the you know th- that point of uh uh you know infinite like whatever like weight or whatever um and, and uh, density uh, with the singularity point uh um she's kind of, you know, even like before, like having any of this kind of science in your, in her head, uh, there's still this kind of like uh, idea of everything that comes, you know, from this like origin point, right. This is like where poetry comes from. This is where, you know, um, how we organize the world, how we organize our sort of intuitions and interpretations, all that comes from this kind of like metaphorical metaphysical singularity, let's call it. Mm -hmm. Um, and normally you would find like in poetry, uh, like sticking to like maybe one or the other, usually like the after, but she combines them in a way where like you sort of think about the after and before in a more kind of like, um, uh, uh, in a way, I think that's more conventional, whereas like just breaking it down literally, you know, this, this sense is kind of like much more ahead of its time, right. To kind of like harken back to, uh, the show that we did on on Leonard Schlein's art and physics. Well, it's not mm-hmm. merely that visual artists uh, see ahead in terms of like uh, uh, you know uh, projecting forward the what's going to happen in terms of scientific discoveries. You could also find similar things in writing, although in writing it's much more so you know psychological insights right before they become ever uh, verbalized and, and written down. Um, so that's that's one little element that that. Uh, 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 stuck out to me. Um, and also, uh, at the end, right. Where she's kind of telling her lover that you could use me for any kind of uses. And these are the uses, mm-hmm. right. How dearest wilt thou have me for most use? I hope to sing by gladly or a fine, sad memory with thy songs to interfuse. So we have like the most conventional thing that you would expect in love poem, but then like turning herself into a sad memory, like what are we talking about her death? Are we talking about like some sort of like coming divorce? Is it like something else? Is that melancholy going to fuel your art? Am I going to be the sacrifice um, Mm -hmm. for your, for your future work? A shade in which to sing of palm or pine. And then this last one, a grave on which to rest from singing, like, you know, talking about the death of the lover that, you know, she would outlive the lover, right? That That's also very unconventional uh, in, 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 a, uh, lo- in a love sonnet, right? Um, so anyway, uh, these are the things that I noticed uh, in, in the poem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think I have a whole lot to add there other than this might be generous, but if we have, like we've talked about before, want to make at least some assumption that she's aiming beyond just the mere love poem with with an, a number of these this would have been written to to robert browning sure but um if if it's in any way a commentary on her as an artist and she's speaking to other artists in the future as well mm-hmm. it, it could be interpreted the same right so uh, you know my poet and then she she goes on so if it's if it's you and i who are here today reading her work who mm-hmm. who are poets in her own right and uh, and her using her work right we're we're yeah we want to read it for its own merit but you also look to to people like her as an influence and as someone to give you ideas and uh you know to to add new new gears into your machinery to use 
Mm-hmm. We, you say, same could be said about us, right? Reading her. So a hope to sing by gladly or a fine sad memory with thy songs to interfuse, a shade in which to sing of palm or pine, a grave on which to rest from singing. Well, the, the choices that she gives us are all oriented around her being used in some way. Mm-hmm. You know, she's, she's yeah. making the assumption that uh, this is probably what I'm good for is in this context to, to be used. Um, and, and then she just asks us to choose which yeah. is also interesting that command right at the end um it kind of throws that whole the whole previous four lines into a bit of a different kind of relief you know mm-hmm. and we have to choose you know i i can't i can't maybe at different times think of you in in all of these ways like i, I have to choose mm-hmm. one way it's uh, it's an interesting command and so uh yeah there there's mm-hmm. there's some merit to that sonnet for sure i maybe some things i missed when i first read it but um, did we both choose uh, 18 and 19 together or just 18? Let me look here. Uh, just 18 and then you had 19. You you had a long run here. You had 17, 18, 19, 20, and then yeah. 22. So uh, it's yeah. 18 and then 22 was our next combined highlighted one. But uh, yeah. yeah. So we both ch- uh, chose 18. I also chose nine, 19 because 19 clearly is also a sonnet unit with 18 it, mm-hmm. it 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 uh, continues the same exact conceit with the lock of hair, right? And does it a little bit differently. Um, yeah. So uh, do you want to take 18 from here? Sure, I can read it. Yeah. Sonnet number 18. I never gave a lock of hair away to a man, dearest, except this to thee, which now upon my fingers thoughtfully, I ring out to the full brown length and say, take it. My day of youth went yesterday. My hair no longer bounds to my foot's glee, nor plant I it from rose or myrtle tree, as girls do anymore. It only may now shade on two pale cheeks the marks of the mark of tears, taut drooping from the head that hangs aside through sorrow's trick. I thought the funeral shears would take this first, but love is justified. Take it thou, finding pure from all those years the kiss my mother left here when she died. So again, you know, this is one that's like, especially with that final line, uh, there's just so much happening in these 14 lines, I think. So um, we transition from, again, at the very beginning of this, uh, a somewhat typical conceit. You know, we all do this for people we love. You, You take parts of yourself and you want to give it to them as a token and claim that it's exclusive. So uh, if it's a lock of hair, if it's some other gift, if it's a poem you write for them, if it's anything, uh, you want to give them reassurances in a way that, you know, you're the only one that I've ever done this for. That's how special you are to me. So it's, it's a bit, it starts out feeling a bit trite uh, in that sense. It's not, it's not bad. It's just kind of common. So, um, you know, and she's, she still has some kind of hesitation or, or even she's still valuing her this part of herself right which now upon my fingers thoughtfully i ring out to the full brown length so she's mm-hmm. she's still regarding it right she's looking at it and considering it to have some worth uh, and say take it my day of youth went yesterday my hair no longer bounds to my foot's glee so there's this really abrupt change that she seems to be talking about having gone through you know j- just yesterday Mm-hmm. My day of youth went. Now, you know, could she mean that in a yesterday as kind of a a grand or a, not a grand a um you know a quick way to talk about a grander past, right? Uh, or mm-hmm. or could she literally mean her, she feels as though it happened just yesterday? My hair no longer bounds to my foot's glee. So, um, you know, her her body, her physical form is is feeling different to her nor a plant I yet from rose or myrtle tree as girls do anymore. So she's, you know, she's not considering herself to be a young girl. She's more mature woman. It only may now shade on two pale cheeks, the mark of tears taut drooping from the head that hangs aside through sorrow's trick. Um, just an interesting phrase, right? I mean, I, I can't, I can't think of seeing anything quite like this from another poet. So on two pale cheeks, the mark of tears, which are taut drooping T a U G H T not T a U T. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's um, her tears have been taught to droop from her head that hangs aside through sorrow's tricks. So she's still in this melancholy state. 
uh, or, or wants to speak about it. And she thought again, this, this coming of death, right. And, uh, and, and juxtaposing it with love. I thought the funeral shears would take this first, right? So I thought I would die before I met anyone that I would be able to give this to, but love is justified. Take it thou finding pure from all those years. And then the kiss my mother left here when she died. So this is kind of a, this is a devastating final line, I think. Mm. And it's what really made this poem stand out to me when I first read it. Um, because this, this mentioning of her mother, right? So this is another aspect of love. Um, we've, we've been conditioned all along the way here. We're almost halfway through the sequence where she's talking about romantic love with a partner, but here is an appearance of maternal love and, a, and another family member. So you're going to find pure from all those years. Um, and I think it's interesting. She says from all those years, not through all those years, mm -hmm. the kiss my mother left here when she died. Um, so there is death. You know, this, and, and this is also, you know, I, I think that Browning probably would have been fairly young still, right? Talking about this. So her mother is not alive anymore. Her mother is passed. So there's maybe this is another source of, of this melancholy mm -hmm. and the sorrow that she's tried to articulate to us over time. Um, but when, when, when he comes in to take this, this lock of hair and maybe kiss her cheek, she's going to find the, he's going to find the kiss that her mother left there when she died. So um, a mysterious sonnet with, with a number of different meanings you could take. And again, just, I think this is a really excellent one. Yeah. Um, you know, e even at the beginning though, the, this idea of a, a slightly like trite beginning, um, what, what, like the inversions come kind of fast, right? So like, first of all, um, uh, Normally, like if you have like poems or you have like uh, like th this kind of like, you know, a generic uh, image of like a, a lock of hair being given as a symbol of love, uh, it's it's not actually ever truly dwelt upon in, in any kind of way. Right. But I mean, she's she's kind of describing it at length. Right. I never gave a lock of hair away to a man, dearest, except this to thee, which now upon my fingers thoughtfully. I ring out to the full brown length and say, take it, right? So first we get that image, right? That's kind of unconventional. I ring out to the full brown length when, in fact, like uh, if you're, you know, unfurling something to the full brown length, it would be the opposite of ringing out, right? So it, there's there's this kind of like sonorous kind of idea behind it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, there, there's kind of like a, you know, like a sound element. And also the fact that, you um, you have this like very stark command that is just left at that, right? I ring out to the full brown length and say, take it. That's it. No commentary, no, you know, bullshit of any kind. It's just literally that. Take it. That's it. Right. So, in terms of like the narrator's interaction, while this was actually going on, right, it's being phrased and framed as, uh, I, you know, I cut it off. I gave it to my lover. I said, take it. That was that. But here in the poem, we have the elaboration, right? So like you said, we have the, my day of youth went yesterday, my hair no longer bounced, my foot's glee, nor plant I it from rose or myrtle tree as girls do anymore, right? Um, and like you mentioned, like later, right? We have those unconventional images, right? The, the tears, right? The mark of tears taught drooping, right? And it's not, it's not merely... Uh, the tears that are drooping right it's the mark of tears that are taught mm -hmm. drooping right so yeah. there's like another like little layer of the unconventional and yeah um obviously the the final line being kind of like the um you know the, the most powerful line i think and and also the one that that takes like a, a technically good poem you know to something just a, a lot more more special right finding mm -hmm. pure from all those years the kiss my mother left here when she died, right? Because it, it does like tend to explain a little bit of, of what's going on, right? We already have 18 sonnets here. We have a world that's being built up. We have a, a character that's being built up. We have the fact that the narrator has a complex relationship with love. We don't know exactly why that is, but you know, we have a, a clue here right? Mm -hmm. And it's a clue that operates well within the context of the poem itself as this kind of, you know, ineffable, unexpected thing. But it's also something that operates, I think, even more strongly in, in the macro picture of the entire sonnet sequence as well. Sure. I agree. And, yeah. 
so so signed at 18 i um i uh or rather signed not signed at 19 the next one i also marked it because it does form a unit right we're back to the lock of hair so sign at 19 the soul's rialto hath its merchandise i barter curl for curl upon that mart and from my poet's forehead to my heart receive this lock which outweighs argosies as purply black as erst to Pindar's eyes, the dim purpurial tresses gloomed athwart the nine white muse brows. For this counterpart, the bay crown's shade, beloved, I surmise, still lingers on thy curl, it is so black. Thus, with a fillet of smooth kissing breath, I tie the shadows safe from gliding back, and lay the gift where nothing hindereth. Here in my heart, as on thy brow, to lack no natural heat till mine grows cold in death. Um, so we we have like, uh, what is this? Like, was this a city in uh, Italy? Maybe uh, I, don't, yeah. I don't know. Like, like yeah, it was. It was like uh, it was like one of these like major like marketplace uh, cities. Uh, so the soul's Rialto hath its merchandise. I bought a curl for curl upon that mart. Right, uh, we're back to the lock. Uh, th this purply black, right? So uh, the images kind of like start piling up here in terms of like what she does uh, with these images at the end, uh, like the the the, the purple. Uh, so she calls her lock of hair purply black. She compares that to the conventionally like purple tresses that um, uh, like the, the, the nine muses are supposed to have like purple hair or something from what I recall. Um, but hers, she calls like purply black. She connects it she makes this artistic connection uh for this counterpart right the bay crowns shade this being like a, 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 a you know the the laurel crown right that we have like mm -hmm. the phrase poet laureate right like the, the laurel leaf crown uh that she gives to the poet right which is you know um kind of like most likely uh, a, a reference to browning or some other lover who is a poet right most likely browning um and uh saying that so like we still have this curl right uh the and, and the shade right the shade on it it seems as if like the shadow on it still exists right it still lingers there because uh the hair is so black right and then we have this like unconventional thing like the fillet of smooth kissing breath right i mean what would that 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 mean i tie the shadows safe from gliding back right now this thing that's like presented as a positive right look at my hair it's so purple black just like the muses there's this black shade to it right uh it still lingers on but now it's as if she wants to like depart from from uh, the shadow right i tie the shadows safe from gliding back right preventing the shadows from returning and lay the gift where nothing hindereth here in my heart as on thy brow to lack no natural heat till mine grows cold in death um not as good as as a poem as uh signed at 18 but again you know if you want to get a sense of how uh these poetry units work with one another how she tries to like refract and reflect and otherwise comment on the stuff um yeah. this is this is just like one of the ways that this is done yeah well so i'll say i actually i have a different interpretation of of this one especially rereading it I think that she's speaking here of of Browning giving her a lock of his hair in return. Do you read it? Can you read it that way? The soul's Rialto hath its merchandise. I barter curl for curl upon that mart. So I give you a curl of mine. You give me a curl of yours. And from yeah. my poet's forehead, so coming from his head to mm -hmm. my heart, receive this lock, which outweighs Argosies. And then she talks of its unique characteristics because in... Oh yeah, actually, I actually I have that written down. Uh, is it her forehead or is it Browning's? Right, there's that. You know, there's that. Yeah, be, um, because she talks about purply black color here, but yeah. hers she talked about as brown in eighteen. Yeah, I ring out to the full brown length and say, take mm -hmm. it. So, I think she's speaking about receiving one back from him here. That's the barter. Um, still linger, still lingers on thy curl. It is so black. Thus, and I, I think rather than fillet, I think she's meaning to say fillet, which is like a little, a little like crimp, um, oh shit, me me metal Let piece me that, that you that like in older times. I think people would maybe still today people would like tie portions of their hair back. Oh yeah, 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 that, that, yeah. The what that like was a, the original meaning, I think. Yeah, of uh, yeah. yeah. 
So with a fillet, you know, she changes it. It's not an actual fillet. It's smooth kissing breath. Yeah. I tie the shadow safe from gliding back and lay the gift. So, yeah. Um, anyway, I mean, I, I agree with your final comment there for sure that, I, you know, I just don't think this is quite as strong of a poem. I think also, though, rereading it, um, she's, uh, she's like, th this is such a different style even than 18 mm -hmm. was, right? This is like, again, much more to that, you know, kind of old school, almost Shakespearean style of speaking and language. And mm -hmm. maybe she's trying to make it, you know, different between hers that she gave and his that she receives and, and how they're different. I I don't know. That's um I could be I could be, you know, imbuing something into it that's not there, but this one's definitely a bit more um the, the music isn't as good as 18, you know, it feels more forced and we mm -hmm. don't also get the payoff of that ineffable image like we did in 18. But um yeah, it's I rereading this, I, I'm actually glad you highlighted it because it, it's interesting for me to to kind of think about these two side by side, which I don't think I so much did on my own readings. So, yeah, uh, lo lo looking up uh, the word fillet. So the French fillet, right? Like when we think of like fillet of fish, it actually has two spellings, right? I didn't realize that you could spell it with uh, the two L's or the one L. I always thought mm -hmm. it was two L's, uh, but fillet, right? With the kind of like harder E T. Um, this is a reference to uh, like ribbons, like a narrow strip of ribbon or similar material often worn as a headband. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I think what you said is, is, uh, is correct. Right. And I also didn't even read my, my notes when I first started talking about it. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. After like reading like 44 uh, poems, uh, you do yeah, lose, tra lose, lose track a little bit. It's a lot. Um, uh, so did you choose a uh, 20 as well, or was that just me? That's just you. Yeah. Um, well, actually a 20 was one of the ones where I was like, why, why the fuck did I choose this? Um, so let's just move on. 22. Okay. The 22. All right. So sonnet number 22, halfway through the, the sequence here. When our two souls stand up erect and strong, face to face, silent, drawing nigh and nigher until the lengthening wings break into fire at either curved point. What bitter wrong can the earth do to us that we should not long be here contented? Think in mounting higher, the angels would press on us and aspire to drop some golden orb of perfect song into our deep, dear silence. Let us stay rather on earth, beloved, where the unfit, contrarious moods of men recoil away and isolate pure spirits and permit a place to stand and love in for a day with darkness and the death hour rounding it. All right, so uh, I think this is another one here that um, it might take us a minute to, to really unpack it. I'm, I don't know that I reread this one again before starting the episode, so I'm kind of reacting to it in real time. Um, but so, you know, again, we've got, um, I think this, these first few lines kind of talking about them um, being together now, I, I'd say some of the, some of the earlier poems that we get kind of this like dodging and fainting and she's unsure about this love it's it's new to her she's kind of trying to step into it and embrace it but here we have you know them together so when our two souls stand up erect and strong face to face silent drawing nigh and nigher um so you know it, it is a little bit of this attitude of um bravado you know at this point when we get to the fourth and fifth line what bitter wrong can the earth do to us that we should not long be here contented so if if this is us you know if we're here together um what what can the earth do to us so but this imagery here I, th I think is is pretty fantastic so in mounting higher the angels would press on us and aspire to drop some golden orb of perfect song into our deep dear silence so um i think again you could argue this is an inversion a, a bit right because another trope that we see a lot with love poetry is you know sing sing a song sing a song of our love you know and and um kind of be triumphant about it but they're cherishing a deep dear silence here mm -hmm. and and literally the angels would would try to ruin what they've got by bringing 
a golden orb of perfect song. Normally, most people would think that sounds pretty good, um, you know. But but she's she's happier with their deep, dear silence. So let us not, you know, move toward heaven. Let us stay rather on earth, beloved, where the unfit, contrarious moods of men recoil away and isolate pure spirits and permit a place to stand and love in for a day with darkness and the death hour rounding it. So this is a beautiful way that her, uh, once again, her melancholy and melancholic attitudes are finding a, a purpose, right? They're, um, and, 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 really, I think, heightening and enhancing her unique take on things and her unique imagery. So uh, again, you know, they'd rather exist where unfit and contrarious moods of men recoil away and isolate pure spirits. So I, I think she's speaking about them there, right? You know, we, mm -hmm. we are pure spirits together, so we can be isolated. We can be in this deep, dear silence unto ourselves and stand there for a day and, and just be in it with darkness and the death hour rounding it. It's kind of got this... Um, grandiose like uh, it almost reminds me of edgar Allan poe or something in a way right like something that's um seems ominous and seems like most people would do anything to avoid it uh she seeks to embrace it yeah um i i think the main reason why i selected the poem is because of that imagery that you uh, isolated um in mounting higher the angels would press on us and aspire to drop some golden orb a perfect song into a deep dear silence i mean this is this is very modern imagery yeah. when i first read it it reminded me of dan schneider's uh holy sonnet number one hmm. uh where there's like some kind of image like um uh uh he's, he's like talking about death right until and the phrase is until or rather unless a sphere of unity intervenes hmm. right and in, in that poem right this is like uh you know, th that would be an object of some kind of uh, objective uh, greatness. Here, this golden orb of perfect song into her deep, dear silence, this is something that she wants to like get away from, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, go going back to this kind of tension that she has just throughout between uh, uh, the subjective self versus trying to take in uh, objectivity uh, around her and trying to uh, understand it, trying to uh, put it into some sort of hierarchy where, you know, her melancholy doesn't have to be the thing that, you know, reigns uh, uh, supreme, right, across her own kind of like internal world. Um, but, you know, it, it is an interesting kind of inversion, right? Uh, the, the normal association with, first of all, angels and second, uh, uh, angels putting something of, of, of perfect song, right? Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, but there's also, you know, th this idea of, uh perfection also not necessarily being uh the target or the thing that's that's necessary right or or, or the thing that ought to be desired yeah right uh there is something here in this kind of silence that she's cultivating um and and uh even if you know the silence doesn't you know even if it doesn't let's say say anything right even if it's not a perfect song right this is this is nonetheless what what she is after yeah. Um, and, uh, again, you know, back to, back to the idea of, of, uh, the, the sub subjectivity, right? I mean, um, it's, it's another poem where it, it's like yet another instance of this kind of like internal war that she has between the two, even if, like you said, you know, she's giving into love here, right. Even if she's kind of like more, uh, ambiguous about it and more uh, ambivalent about it in other poems, the giving in to love uh, in this poem also doesn't necessarily strike me as uh, a purely kind of like unambiguous positive, right? There, there is like some kind of cost, I think, that that is associated with or ought to be associated with like rejecting that golden orb of perfect song, right? Sent to mm -hmm. you by, by an angel, right? Um, especially in the context of like some other poems, like there is like a little bit of religiosity, right? This is, um, th this is supposed to be a kind of positive, both mo in, in most people's minds and maybe even the narrators to some extent. Um, but anyway, it, it's not necessarily, yeah. you know, like one of the best sonnets here, but, uh, uh, you know, some interesting images, some more highlighting of the kinds of tensions that she's dealing with in the sonnets, the kind of complicated views on everything from, from love to art um yeah. well and so, before we move on to the next one one um thing i'll say because uh, I, we mentioned this 
earlier in the episode, uh, any of these poems would be pretty good exemplars of it, but this one's just standing out to me where, again, she continues to stick with this same exact rhyme scheme uh, and, and then the, you know, the pentameter throughout for every single sonnet. And I think she's to be commended for it. You know, while you and I, I think both agree that it, it does maybe wear thin by, I mean, we're only halfway through, but um, by the end, but um, she's to be commended because the, the cadence and, and the rhythm and like the, the choices that she makes with the lines and the way that she's drawing out these moments and images and, and stories, um, the rhyme is not too, it's not imposing on that too badly. Right. So like, and maybe part of it's how you and I are also reading it, but it's important for readers to know, uh, or maybe listeners to know if they're not like sitting with these poems in front of them that, you know, she's, she does a really good job with these long sentences. I mean, a lot of these are pretty long lines and then she's just containing several line breaks within it mm. and uh, and making these end rhymes happen but they don't feel i mean even i i'll certainly speak for myself i can learn from this because i know um probably my strongest poetry that i've written employs end rhyme mm -hmm. but but i know that it's meant to kind of hit there that's that's part of the point is the the rhyme and the you know the, the musicality that that gives to the poem but she's uh, she's doing a very nice job of showing that like you can employ a technique, but not have it be overbearing um, and kind of uh, detract. You know, I guess what I'm saying in summary is that it's not like, oh, well, you know, she picked the word higher to rhyme with nigher and fire. And mm -hmm. that's just clunky and stupid. You know, she should have done something better. Um, no, you know, it doesn't it doesn't really come off that way. Right. It, it's. Mm -hmm successful be here contented think in mounting higher the angels would press on us right like it works with with the rest of what comes up before and after so just a, a technical point to draw out there yeah um so i i, I chose 25 i i forget whether uh, you did or not but i mean 25 is one of my uh it's not necessarily a, a the, the the best on in the sequence but it is one of my favorites uh in the sequence uh, mostly well, you picked 25 it, and I picked 26. So we'll okay. do these back to back then. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this is one of my favorites uh, specifically for how it deals with uh, what you expect to be, you know, trite imagery, what you would expect to be uh, kind of, you know, just conventional stuff. And she just does a whole lot of inversions here. Um, I was actually talking about this poem a couple of days ago with some people. Um, so sign of 25. A heavy heart, beloved, have I borne from year to year until I saw thy face. And sorrow after sorrow took the place of all those natural joys, as lightly worn as the string pearls, each lifted in its turn by a beating heart of dance time. Hopes of pace were changed to long despairs, till God's own grace could scarcely lift above the world forlorn my heavy heart. Then thou didst bid me bring and let it drop adown thy calmly great deep being. Fast it sinketh as a thing which its own nature does precipitate, while thine doth close above it, mediating betwixt the stars and the unaccomplished fate. Um, and I mean, this poem does a lot of uh, the same kind of stuff that uh, we've been kind of like talking about building up to, whether it's like love inversions or uh inversions of like subject versus object you know a personhood that kind of thing um but i mean we, we begin with something that is kind of like uh it, it it sounds trite right this is exactly what so many poets have done before her right a heavy heart beloved mm -hmm. have i borne right um from year to year until i saw thy face but what she does with this is interesting because i mean she takes this idea of the heavy heart and she treats it literally, right? Like yes, th th yeah. th this, this cliche becomes literally like the uh, image and the fulcrum on which so much turns. And it's a fulcrum on which like all these other like really startling images really start coming at you very quickly, right? In the latter portion uh, of the sonnet, right? Mm -hmm. So we have uh, the heavy heart here. Right, um, and she starts playing with the uh, idea of heaviness, uh, uh, of a uh, heaviness again, right? Till God's own grace could scarcely lift it above the world forlorn, my heavy heart, right? Kind of playing a little bit with this idea of um, 
you know, there, there were, there were constant like scholastic, you know, debates about like, you know, can God, uh, 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 do something like lift, uh, like create a rock too heavy for him to lift. Right. right, like right. One of these like classic little, like little de mini debates. And I mean, she, you know, she's playing with that, but then by treating it literally, like, look at these images that you get, then thou didst bid me bring and let it drop a down thy calmly great deep being fast. It sinketh as a thing which its own nature does precipitate. Mm -hmm. Right. So then you think like, well, wh what is exactly this heavy heart's own nature? What exactly is it precipitating? Right. Um, well, wh what is what is it responsible for from this point forward? What is its function? You know, not just in, 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 in the poem in terms of like technical, technically what it's doing, but rhetorically, what is it doing? What is it doing in terms of like the, the narrator's psyche? I mean, there, there's lots of questions that you could ask here that all kind of like hinge on, on this image. Mm -hmm. while, while thine doth close above it, mediating betwixt the stars and the unaccomplished fate, right? So we have that kind of uh, uh, sense of, you know, the, the stars being um, uh, somehow privy to and indicative of uh, what goes on, you know, uh, in, in human lives, right? This is like an ancient idea, but then you have the unaccomplished fate, right? On the one hand, this is, you know, perhaps like, you know, responding to, to the idea uh, of stars, uh, you know, c c controlling fate, uh, that things that you could see in the stars that you could read in the stars have not yet happened, but also the unaccomplished fate. I mean, could be referring to many other things, right? In the context yeah. of like, all the poems, uh, clearly this is a narrator that is interested in artistic creation, is constantly meditating on uh, uh, artistic questions and on uh, the philosophy of art, you know, aesthetics, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, th this could refer to, to many other things beyond the kind of like purely conventional of, you know, uh, what you could read in the stars, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's unaccomplished, right? Like this is, this is, this is a love sonnet with some sort of kind of like, you know, it's almost like a cliffhanger ending, right? Um, it's yeah. not, uh, th there is no, uh, uh, there is no clear ending in terms of some sort of uh, emotional closure, right, for the characters involved. Like there, there's something else going on here. Um, so anyway, that that's why I chose uh, this, this sonnet. Yeah. No, good, good stuff. I, um, I don't know that I picked up on that quite as easily in the first time around. Obviously, I didn't highlight this as one to talk about but um good points there yeah do you want me to read 26 yeah that's this is the one that you uh selected yeah all right so sonnet 26 i lived with visions for my company instead of men and women years ago and found them gentle mates nor thought to know a sweeter music than they played to me but soon their trailing purple was not free of this world's dust their lutes did silent grow, and I myself grew faint and blind below their vanishing eyes. Then thou didst come to be, beloved, what they seemed. Their shining fronts, their songs, their splendors, better yet the same as river water hollowed into fonts, met in thee, and from out thee overcame my soul with satisfaction of all wants, because God's gifts put man's best dreams to shame. So I, I think that this is one of the most straightforward sonnets in the whole collection. I don't think it's particularly difficult to pick up on what she's saying here. There's not, um, you know, so much of the the hyper intricate imagery and and word weaving. Um, you know, in the beginning, she's talking about basically. Let's assume she says I lived with visions for my company, but let's assume you know that meant that she was then maybe translating those into art art of some kind. Um, you know this and she was content with that right she found them gentle mates and didn't really want to know about anything else um but eventually you know she talks about their trailing purple was not free of this world's dust and their lutes did silent grow uh, i think soon their trailing purple was not free of this world's dust is a certainly a much stronger image than their lutes did silent grow that's kind of typical right you know there mm -hmm. was music playing for me and then eventually the music died um but the, the image before that's interesting and I myself grew faint and blind below their vanishing eyes. So, you know, she's she's now kind of disillusioned for whatever reason. Who knows why? Uh, with 
you know, with these visions and, and with maybe her creative um, impulses coming out of that. And then, then thou didst come to be beloved what they seemed. Uh, and so, and so, you know, the rest of the poems kind of praising Robert Browning and uh, you know, him as her love and, and all this other kind of thing. Um, so it, it led me to question whether she's being totally genuine here. Uh, and I don't know, I don't know what you think, but you know, all of her length, there's nothing really in her language in the last six lines that hint that she's being, you know, disingenuous about this. It, it seems pretty straight ahead. Um, and so, you know, I, I just don't know because so much of what she's said prior to this and then some of what she'll say in the other sonnets we're going to still read seems like, you know, while she values him highly and their love, um, she doesn't necessarily do the typical thing, which is kind of what comes through in this sonnet, which is to say, and you're better than all that other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. You, you just, you, you became the, you know, the embodiment of what I thought I had before, you know, my life was hollow or nothing without you, this kind of thing. And it's usually so trite, you know, and overwrought. Mm -hmm. So she goes for that here. Plus the, because God's gifts put man's best dreams to shame. Um, whereas even in the sonnet you just read, you know, sonnet 25, she talks about, a an unaccomplished fate, you know, that, that doesn't, it seems that she, she knows or wants to know, you know, within herself, what her, her destiny is or her role is to be a great artist and keep working toward accomplishing something. But then here there's this, you know, yeah, even if I were to do that, um, you know, whatever, whatever God gives me in this case, you is so much better than that. So it just seems kind of odd that she would make an assertion like this. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think, I also think this is one of the, you know, I highlighted this to talk about because I think it's one of the weaker sonnets, uh, you know, from the, from the entire series for some of the reasons I've talked about. So curious if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, first of all, in my uh, notes, right. I have, um, you know, the, the ending, uh, I wrote, uh, a uh, hokey line with no real, you know, inversion of any sort. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because God's gifts put man's best dreams to shame, it, both in sentiment and phrasing, like even, you know, by 1850, you, you would have had a whole lot of similar stuff in poetry and prose. It's just yeah. a very kind of common sentiment without any special kind of uh, for phrasing to like, uh, you know, resurrected from being exactly mm -hmm. that. Right. Um uh, I, 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 I did, you know, subjectively, I guess, enjoy some of the beginning simply because, I mean, I, I kind of like grew up in a, uh, a, a similar way, right. Kind of like, uh, just being interested instead of, you know, my, my, uh, local peers, right. At school or like at neighborhoods, right. My, my idea was my peers would be the people and the characters in books. It would be writers yeah. themselves. Right. And this would be my, competition this would be the people that i need to sort of be in company with as opposed to just being forced into company by pure happenstance now biographically uh i i, I think it is uh true that um you know she she did she did credit browning with uh not just kind of like opening up her personal life i guess but also with like improving her her poetry mm -hmm. right um i, I haven't read like her, I, I know like a lot of her like early poetry still exists. In fact, like in terms of like a, a juvenilia, like um, the, the collection of like Elizabeth Bauer Browning juvenilia is probably larger than of any other poet, you know, up until that time. Yeah. Right. Uh, I haven't read it. I'm not sure if it's any good, but it wouldn't surprise me that as she's kind of young and also very emotionally immature, probably because it does seem like she, you know, grew up uh, kind of sheltered. Um, uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me that it, it took certain life changes for her to actually also improve as an artist, right? Not that necessarily, you know, one or the other is is, is necessary for, for these changes, but, um, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me if this is kind of what she's talking about. So, you know, whether or not it's, it, it's honest, um, I mean, I, 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 I'm not like within the context of like, like you said, like there's no there's nothing written really in this sonnet that would give you, you know, the thought that there's something going on here that's disingenuous. 
right? Even if, if we view this from the perspective of like, you know, this is a character speaking and we have all the kinds of, you know, characters like inner machinations from the, the, the previous poems and later poems, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, you know, how to uh, uh, answer that question. I, and I, but I will say that I, I wouldn't be able to like point to any evidence in the text for, for the assertion so i mean uh who knows but um I, I i did kind of like highlight this in my notes simply because of like some of the some of the weakness um mm -hmm. but beyond that don't really have much to say about about uh, this on it yep no good that's that's pretty much why i wanted to draw it out too just to show also that uh you know we've we've been very strongly praising her work in this sequence all the way up until now and um, it, it maybe if anything, it shows how difficult it is to sustain mm -hmm. excellence through, you know, a whole sequence like this, because it, again, is this a terrible poem? No, it's not a terrible poem. It's, uh, but it's, it's probably, you know, okay or good, um, mm -hmm. at, at its best. But, um, yeah, just, I, I would think and hope that readers and viewers can, um, and listeners can take a look at that one and kind of see why, even though there's some sentiments that especially if you're a creative person yourself, you might like to latch on to, I'm with you, you know, that I lived with visions for my company instead of men and women years ago. Um, it's, it's a nice idea because I think sometimes, or maybe a lot of the time we do feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, so that like when I, those first couple lines, I was like, oh, you know, let's see where the rest of this goes. Cause it's kind of expressing very directly a sentiment uh, that I've felt myself, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it just sort of peters out uh, over the rest of it. So anyway, yeah. All right, Toby's here to uh, help us interpret Elizabeth Barrett Browning. All right, so so Sonnet uh, thirty three um, is is one of the most famous ones. I believe it's thirty three and uh, what is it forty three? Forty three, yeah, yeah. They're the most famous. Um, yeah, so we're gonna talk about why maybe that is, uh, but but this one is also one of my favorites in the entire sequence, definitely. Um, and it's also just a, I think a truly uh, a great um, sonnet. So Sonnet 33, yes, call me by my pet name. Let me hear the name I used to run at when a child from innocent play and leave the cowslips piled to glance up in some face that proved me dear with the look of its eyes. I miss the clear fond voices, which being drawn and reconciled into the music of heavens undefiled, call me no longer. Silence on the beer while I call God, call God. So let thy mouth be heir to those who are now exanimate. Gather the north flowers to complete the south and catch the early love up in the late. Yes, call me by that name and I in truth with the same heart will answer and not wait. Um, so, I mean, there, 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 there's a lot uh, going on here. It gets more and more kind of uh, abstracted in, in a positive way as, as it goes on. Um, yeah. So... You know, we have that that you know command uh, at the beginning. Yes, call me by my by my by my pet name. She's uh, clearly you know, reminiscing uh, about her her past, right? She's trying to draw some kind of connection uh, to her youth. Um, she's the connection explicitly that she starts to draw is uh, she would look up at at the faces after play, right? And they would have a a loving look at her, right? In mm -hmm. the same way that you know we surmise that. Uh, she uh, sees her lover looking upon her right during uh, the writing uh, of this poem and during their kind of day-to-day -day interactions. Um, I miss the clear fond voices, which being drawn and reconciled into the music of heavens undefiled, call me no longer, right? Silence on the beer, right? So we're going to get this kind of the last six lines be being the inversion, right? So suddenly it's as if, this youth, right, that she starts with with such excitement, right? We have this exclamation here. Um, she's thinking about love. She's thinking about the past. And all that is just immediately, you know, put to an end, right? They call me no longer. Silence silence on the beer. So, you know, perhaps you start imagining some kind of corpse or a funeral of some sort. Uh, well, I call God, call God. So let my mouth, so let thy mouth be heir to those who are now examined. Um, and we have this, it's just ver some very interesting images near the end, gather the North flowers to complete the South, right? Uh, you could imagine this is like, you know, 
taking bundles from one part of the garden, combining it with uh, uh, bundles from another part. But it's clearly also just discussing something else as well. I mean, there there, there must be something else going on, right? Uh, th this kind of like, we need to combine the North and the South together. We need to complete, right, my original imagery, my original kind of childhood thoughts, my experiences back then, right? We need to now bring them to fruition, right? Because I cannot, you know, they, they call me no longer. I cannot uh, have those experiences anymore unless perhaps there is some kind of sublimation. And she gets all of that, you know, this idea of the, the sublimation and this like uh, completing like one part of her life, uh, bleeding into the next part of her life and combining them in some way. She gets all, all of that in, in one line, right? One image, gather the North flowers to complete the South and catch the early love up in the late, right? As if the two are in her mind equivalent, as if the two can be just as powerful. And perhaps as if, you know, one of them was, was immature, right? It was innocent play. It was in a sense, just, you know, exactly what, what a childhood is, is more or less about, right? It's this, you know, it's almost like this non-judgmental love, it's a love that in many respects is, um, you know, uh, without complication. Uh, mm -hmm. But here, you know, the kind of mature love that you get between adults, right? This is, this is something else, right? This requires that kind of sublimation that she's alluding to. And also the, the, the last two lines, very reminiscent of, um, uh, of uh, John Milton, right? In, in the, uh, mm -hmm. the, that famous sonnet, uh, I guess the, the, the kind of like, uh, you know, after his death, it was titled uh, On His Blindness. I don't think it was called that during his life. But yes, call me by that name. And I, in truth, with the same heart, will answer and not wait, right? So, you know, what, what could that waiting be referring to, right? Uh, perhaps there was this hesitancy in childhood that now, finally, maybe she's getting over. Like, we're getting closer and closer to the end of the sonnet sequence, I think you can make the argument that uh, by the time they would get to the end, she's much more comfortable with love in a more kind of, I guess, conventional sense than she was at the beginning. Um, the loves that she experienced as a child, right, perhaps were uh, uh, loves that she uh, had to wait upon or had to, you know, somehow kind of, you know, keep away from her in, in some ways, at least. Um, and it's different from the sublimated love. And the so so the 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 John uh, uh, Milton um, sonnet uh, uh, ends with something like I think the end line is uh, the uh, they serve they also serve best uh, who like simply wait or something right kind of like you know the idea that uh, God uh, calls uh, human beings to all these like fancy professions whether it's like maybe you could be a knight right maybe you could be a king right maybe you could be a priest and you as someone that is religious you as someone that is faithful wants to fulfill all those promises wants to do all those things but mm -hmm. you know milton gets this idea across that well god also wants those who will merely be faithful and wait right and yeah. here it's kind of like, you know, I, I think definitely, you know, this is some kind of allusion to that sonnet and it's an inversion of that sonnet because she, she no longer wants to wait, right? She has, you know, perhaps some issues with that conception of the world, with that conception of faithfulness. Granted, this isn't a, a religious sonnet, but it's still, you know, faithfulness transplanted to, um, you know, to, 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 to love, right. So like a, a different kind of love, right. If you want to like, you know, view God's love or, or faithfulness in, in, in that sense, right? So, anyway, uh, definitely one of my one of my favorites in the sequence. Yeah. No, I think you summed all of it up quite well there. Um, maybe the only other reason that I can think uh, why this would be one of the best known sonnets is just that first line. It's very mm -hmm. distinctive. Um, I, I think you and I would agree we could search through and probably already have um, in the ones we've talked about to this point, find better first lines mm -hmm. just to, you know, in terms of like pure poetry, but this one, I mean, she's got, I was just kind of scanning some of the preceding poems to this one. Cause we did skip over uh, several before we arrived here. 
and I was going to say that this first line is the the first like really um, totally vulnerable and triumphant and like all embracing mm-hmm. phrase of you know what not not only am I okay with love like in fact call me by my pet name like um, it it just it's it's almost erotic in a way yeah, yeah. or cer- certainly affectionate right mm-hmm. I, I think maybe in these in more modern times we think about pet names or mm-hmm. uh, you know whatever as like something that that hints at intimacy and um s- sexually and emotionally um yeah. but pro- probably even back then i mean I, I don't know how long the, the phrase pet name had been around um maybe she invented it i don't know but you know what i mean it's like it's it, it still even when i look at the preceding poems that stands out as a, like a pretty much all out embrace of uh of the the state that she's in and the relationship that she has here um and even there's a nice juxtaposition with that line and then the the eighth line uh, or the ninth line. So she says, yes, call me by my pet name with an exclamation point. Let me hear the name I used to run at. And then eventually we get that silence on the beer while I call God, call God. Mm-hmm. So let thy mouth be heir to those who are now exanimate. Um, so she she wants him to call her by her pet name. And then she's also calling God. Um, which I think that's a mysterious line too, by the way, you know, while mm-hmm. I call God hyphen call God exclamation point hyphen. So there, she, she wants that to stand out and it very much does stand out, um, in the midst of that poem. So anyway, that, I think those would be some of the reasons, um, why this one would be like, so particularly well, well known. Um, and, and it is a strong poem. I think there are, there are stronger in the sequence, mm-hmm. but it, but it's certainly uh, quite good. So I, I don't think I've got anything more to say on that one. Yeah, and I mean, all, all, also like in terms of like, uh, you know, if you want to frame this in, you know, through the lens of like feminist criticism or whatever, um, you know, the, like, like you said earlier, like this is kind of, it, it is very arresting, perhaps kind of sexual in some ways. Uh, um, and, and, I can't think of any kind of like similar po- like poems, right. Or first lines, like from, from anyone from like a woman or whatever, that is this kind of like, you know, th- 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 this kind of emphatic, uh, mm-hmm. this, this free, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's just a shame that this kind of thing is like l- l- not as well known. And to the extent that this poem is well known, uh, most you know most readers wouldn't have a clue though that this comes on the heels of all those other complications that we're talking about I, that's not to say that this poem doesn't have its own kind of like new set of like complications i mean it does right um but you know it's 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 uh it's 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 something that works very well as its own poem right and it works even better in the context of the sequence sure so um, um you want to go on to 34 yeah uh so 34 and, right. and and this is also like a continuation of 33 right it's it forms like a poem unit right with yeah. the two yep so sonnet 34 with the same heart i said i'll answer thee as those when thou shalt call me by my name lo the vain promise is the same the same perplexed and ruffled by life strategy When called before, I told how hastily I dropped my flowers or break off from a game. To run an answer with a smile that came at play last moment and went on with me through my obedience. When I answer now, I drop a grave thought, break from solitude. Yet still my heart goes to thee, ponder how, not as to a single good, but all my good. Lay thy hand on it, best one. And allow that no child's foot could run fast as this blood. Um, so, for, first of all, unless uh, words were pronounced, I know they were pronounced differently, uh, certainly in times back then. We've got maybe some near rhyme rather mm-hmm. than direct rhyme employed mm-hmm. in this one. Solitude with good with blood mm-hmm. um, for the end, and uh, you know. Stra- the strategy hastily um so anyway it's it's you know she's branching out just a little bit at least from the super direct rhyming but um anyway you know i, I think that this one here 
um, you know, she, she's again, certainly embracing this love. I mean, when we get to the middle of the poem, when called before I told how hastily I dropped my flowers or break off from a game to run and answer with the smile that came at play last moment and went on with me through my obedience. When I answer now, I drop a grave thought and break from solitude. Yet still my heart goes out to thee. So, um, I, you know, I, I think that by far the strongest part of this poem is the, the last couple of lines. So we have kind of this childhood imagery that she talks about earlier. Um, and if we're taking this right on the heels of 33, right, with call me by my pet name, that name they used to call me. So she still brings that up again in the first line here, when thou shalt call me by my name. But then by the end, and she talks about breaking off games and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, yet still my heart goes to thee, ponder how, not as to a single good, but all my good. Lay thy hand on it, best one, and allow that no child's foot could run fast as this blood. So again, uh, this kind of modern modern imagery in a way, I don't know that like your blood running or pumping fast when in love was a cliche by then. Maybe mm -hmm. it was. I mean, it certainly is today. But the the again, this kind of uh, like rubbing up against each other with the ideas of her childhood versus her now mature love and no child's foot could run fast as this blood. It's, it's a fresh and interesting image, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, that's probably about all I have to say on that. Cause I, that really, to me, those last couple of lines were the, the reason to highlight this one uh, as yeah. she kind of goes deeper into that, that metaphor, but any other thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, e even if uh, this idea is of, you know, run fast as this blood, uh, like even if it's been used by poets uh, prior to her, and, and I think you could sort of uh, say that it maybe was like, I can't think of any po poems off the top of my head, but it wouldn't surprise me. But I mean, it does liter literalize it, right? Like the connection is explicitly to the child's foot, the running this like mm -hmm. odd, you know, almost like eroticization of childhood being connected to today. Uh, the literal meaning here compared to like fast of this blood. I mean, that that's that's different, right? Um, it's, you know, w when you literalize some language that might be like a little bit trite, otherwise it, it does change it in, in many ways. Um, I, I think like, you know, even if you take away a uh, sonnet uh, 33 and you just kind of like take it on its own terms, uh, I mean, th this is a, a very good sonnet, but uh, I do think in combination, I, I would probably put in the same category a, a, of uh, other sonnets where there is like a clear, you know, like most powerful like thing around which these these uh, other sonnets revolve around. And mm -hmm. uh, I think so much of the meaning in this next sonnet is already kind of implicit and explicit in sonnet 33. Yeah. Right. This idea with the same heart will answer, not wait with the same heart. I said, I'll answer thee. Uh, she already gets at so many of the meanings here. Right. And, and I think overall better. Right. In, in, in the first sonnet. Um, so yeah. in, in this way, like I, I consider the sonnet like a, a good, you know, it's a good poem. It's a good exercise. But it is mostly a kind of like re recap of what we find here. Right. It, it is a kind of recap. You could, you know, sort of think of like, a, you know, a great Woody Allen film. Right. And then some of the kind of uh, recaps that he has later on a little bit. That's not to say that there aren't new things that he does. There aren't interesting things. There aren't good qualities. But uh, I don't think it, it compares to uh, Sonnet 33 for those reasons. Sure. Uh, 36 next. Okay, 36. Uh, sorry, by the way, if you can hear my dog in the background, he's um, he's realized that Kristen is gone, so he's posted up at the door and snorting underneath the door a lot and whining, which uh, which he does sometimes. So, well, that, it's supposed to be a plus, though. It's a positive, right? Um, <laughs> this is this is what people want. Yeah. <laughs> um, sign a, a little bit of real life action from. Uh, yeah, I mean, people do crave this. I mean, like we could literally, we could literally <laughs> put your dog behind a paywall. We could yeah. set up a Patreon right now and say, listen, you guys could get like doggy <laughs> action behind a bowling behind a paywall, right? So um I, I think it is what people want, honestly. Yeah, well he's he's being silly right now, but uh anyway, all right, sonnet 36. All right, so sonnet 36. 
When we first met and loved, I did not build upon the event with marble. Could it mean to last a love set pendulous between sorrow and sorrow? Nay, I rather thrilled, distrusting every light that seemed to gild the onward path and feared to overlean a finger even. And though I have grown serene and strong since then, I think that God has willed a still renewable fear. O oh, love, O oh, troth, let these enclasped hands should never hold this mutual kiss drop down between us both as an unknown thing, once the lips being cold. And love be false if he to keep one oath must lose one joy by his life's star foretold. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I consider this poem similar, a little bit similar to, you know, some of that kind of like perfect orb imagery, right? We have like that sheer physicality of uh, lest these enclasped hands should never hold this mutual kiss drop down between us both as an unknown thing, right? This is a, I mean, this is a very modern take on love, right? The, a mutual kiss as an unknown thing. That, that, you know, that's very new, right? If you're looking for uh, a territory that she's covering in terms of like, you know, how, how can we treat this like age old subject of love? How can we find a fresh perspective? How can we find some new angles? I mean, this is one of the things, right? And again, this is like a, a lesser sonnet compared to some of the other ones. But again, even in the lesser sonnets, right? You always have some little twist, right? You have some item um, that, that kind of, at least like pre prefigures at least like some some of the modernity we see in her other poetry and also like in in the poets that that came after her um so uh beyond that uh, i don't have much to say i i'm not sure if you you didn't write this one down right so um this one is 30 this is a 36 36 i did have this one down um okay. To be honest now, rereading it, I'm not exactly sure, other than some of your comments, what I would have drawn out of it uniquely. Um, mm. Still renewable fear. I mean, it's a good opening think, line. It's a good opening yeah. line at minimum, right? When we first met and loved, I did not build upon the event with marble. Yeah, I, that probably stood out to me. And then maybe the the later lines of lest these unclasped hands should never hold this mutual kiss drop down between us both as an unowned thing once mm -hmm. the lips being cold and love be false so um yeah i mean good good phrasing interesting imagery but I, i'm content to move on if you want to i also had 37 highlighted but you did not so i could i could read 37 and give thoughts on that and then i and then we're almost we're almost there because then I think it was 43 and 44 were our last two. So all right, let's uh let, let's move through that. Um okay. here we are at 37. Okay. Sonnet number 37. Pardon, oh pardon, that my soul should make of all that strong divineness which I know for thine and thee, an image only so formed of the sand and fit to shift and break. It is that distant years, which did not take thy sovereignty, recoiling with a blow, have forced my swimming brain to undergo their doubt and dread, and blindly to forsake thy purity of likeness and distort thy worthiest love to a worthless counterfeit. As if a shipwrecked pagan, safe in port, his guardian sea god to commemorate, should set a sculptured porpoise, gills a snort, and vibrant tail within the temple gate. So um, I, I think with this one here, um, I think it's a good or, or excellent sonnet overall, but I think those last few lines, um, it reminded me of Hart Crane a lot, mm -hmm. right? This uh, shipwrecked pagan safe in port, his guardian sea god to commemorate should set a sculptured porpoise, gills a snort and vibrant tail within the temple gate. So it's talking about basically, you know, creating a god, right? Um, mm -hmm. Uh, to create some sculpture of a porpoise uh, with within a temple. I mean, so just a really interesting, I mean, to me, this was like nothing else that she's written in the mm -hmm. entire sequence. I, I could be wrong. I'm happy to be corrected on that if someone else can find imagery that's quite this um, oddball, you know, com compared to the rest. But um, I think that 
especially when you look at what she talks about before, right? So this whole poem has some imagery of the, the shore and the sand and the sea. Um, but she talks about how, you know, uh, pardon me, basically, that out of out of everything I know of you, how strong you are, I've only managed to form a, a, a sand image, right? Mm-hmm. And it's weak and it can shift and break, you know, basically what you are, I even how hard I've tried, I don't think I've really uh, given it form and essence properly and, and strongly. It is that distant years, which did not take thy sovereignty recoiling with a blow have forced my swimming brain another interesting image again was Mm. was your mind or your brain swimming a cliche by then i don't know uh it's kind of hard to imagine it would have been i don't know that's that's interesting but uh to undergo their doubt and dread and blindly to forsake thy purity of likeness and distort thy worthiest love to a worthless counterfeit so more more of the same idea that you know she's basically getting him wrong or not doing him justice Mm -hmm. But then this jump, you know, this, to me, what seems like a big jump to comparing herself to a shipwrecked pagan safe in port. Um, So even though you're shipwrecked, you've still made it safe to the port, right? Even Mm -hmm. in that one line, it's kind of interesting. So you haven't died, you you know, you haven't lost your life, but then you now say, well, because I made it, I have to commemorate my guardian sea god. Mm -hmm. Uh, So again, it's, it's just... I don't know. It's kind of weird and wacky. I really got a, a bit of a kick out of it because it's just, it, it's imagery that feels modern. And, and again, I think this kind of thing was expanded upon a lot by some of the more uh, modern 20th century poets. This is also feels Stevensian a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. Something, uh, something he could have riffed on or, or whatever. But um, I think that's, you know, that's my main reason for highlighting it. Yeah. I, I mean, even in questions as to like, you know, is there uh you know, are there some cliches here? I mean, um, this swimming, swim, swimming brain, it is like arresting even, I think, to, to modern ears. But even so, there's she, she like a lot of her kind of like cliche versions do revolve around, you know, the idea of making uh, uh, some of these images like more literal mm-hmm. or somehow kind of expanded upon it, you know, in some other way. And I mean, even here, right, we have the swimming brain right there's this there's the image of like a seawater right um here we have uh an image only so form of the sand right more kind of uh you know sea imagery um even like you know the distant years right you could imagine this being a kind of metaphor for you know seafaring vessels people that you know make a living on the sea and later on right obviously the, the shipwrecked pagan safe and port Right. There is a kind of like literalness uh, to these images that all kind of, you know, cohere around, you know, the same kind of a set of ideas. Um, and uh, uh, even even so. Right. Like so like so his guardian sea got to commemorate. So, you know, uh, in the sonnet sequence, right, she is someone at, at minimum that is some sort of deist. Right. Mm-hmm. you know probably not some kind of christian but there is some kind of like deism there um and she's not you know she's not making fun of the paganism she's she's in fact like lifting it up right yeah. A- despite you know this kind of like kind of like light strain of deism throughout many of the poems she is lifting up the pagan right she's saying the pagan safe and port is actually disrespecting like the image of his sea god Right. Instead of having, you know, a, a sea god to truly commemorate, instead of being able to create an image that is worthy of the sea god, you just set a sculptured porpoise, right? This kind of ridiculous gill snorting, this vibrant tail, perhaps like too colorful or, or you know, s- something else that this image you might be leaning on. Um, you know, uh, it's, you know, and, and like, like this kind of, like it, it would be a novel image, you know, by any kind of metric. It's a novel image by modern, you know, standards, but even more so uh, in the context of some of the debates and some of the kind of, you know, wider, you know, perhaps even political questions going on at the time when this was being written. So, yeah, I agree. Uh, interesting poem. Uh, very well done. Um you know, uh, at a minimum, this is something to sort of build build upon. And like you mentioned, uh, this is this is a kind of like point of view, a, a way of viewing the world that 
later poets did tap into kind of more fully, more conclusively, more comprehensively, you know, this kind of thing. Suffuses her crane, uh, this sort of thing suffuses um, uh, Wallace Stevens, right? Whereas for her, right, this is just kind of like a, 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 a little point that comes up, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so what, we have uh, only two more yeah, we both highlighted 43 next, and then I had uh, 44, which more than anything was just to read the final poem in the sequence to, you know, to, to cap it off and maybe even compare it back to number one or something like that. So you want, do you want yeah. to read 43? Sonnet 43. Yeah, yeah. So, so this, this sonnet, uh, uh, Sons from the Portuguese, number 43, is, it is probably the most famous one, right, in the sequence. Uh, at least yeah. I've, I've seen it in the most anthologies like even when uh, the other one doesn't appear uh, this one does um yeah so sauna 43 how do i love thee let me count the ways i love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace i love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot going on here. Uh, to me, kind of like the most uh, important thing, at least early on, is so when she says, "How do I love thee?" Let me count the ways. You have this interesting image that again goes back to some of the earlier stuff that I was saying. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace. Um, She's, you know, uh, on some level, you could say that throughout these uh, sonnets, she's not perfectly comfortable with her art. Sometimes there's a tension between the greatness of love versus, you know, if she, if you put into a hierarchy, melancholy or art or or whatever, right? And they seem to be kind of like switching places, right, from from poem to poem sometimes. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, although she seems to have like fully given into love right like in a way where she's not shy about it anymore it is interesting to say that i love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace like when you think of what she might mean by being an ideal grace there is you know may, maybe uh to, to to call this like a, a a reference to art might be too strong uh but there is some kind of like aesthetic quality especially the word grace right because grace like as far as like art as an experiential thing right which is like the realm of aesthetics like grace speaks to that right mm, um yeah. like like almost like a, a propriety to conduct a propriety to to um you know like like let's call it taste right if we want to use that word uh, and, and, but she says like, I love thee to this depth, to this breath, to this height when feeling out of sight, is it, you know, when she's feeling small, when she's feeling like she's not accomplishing what she wants to accomplish, right? Cause for the ends of being an ideal grace, there is a kind of, you know, objectivity that is, she's clear, clearly seeking that maybe in subjective terms, she's failing. Maybe she is too caught up on herself. Maybe there's something else going on, but this thing that is supposed to like, you know how, um, you know, like Shakespeare has a sonnet where he's like enumerating the different ways that he would, you know, uh, love uh, uh, his, uh, his lover. That, that's a lot more conventional compared to something like this, right? I mean, even in the first example of how I love, it's, 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 it's kind of, you know, it's, it's complicated, right? It's not as simple as, you know, I, I, I love, I love you to the depth and breadth and height of my soul, you know, in heaven or something like she's not talking about that. She's almost like self deprecating here, um, about that. Right. I love these, the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. All right. W what is every day's most quiet need? 
right? And is is there, you know, is there a, a, a greatness here that we could talk about? Or is this also a little bit self-deprecating in some way? I love the freely as men strive for right, right? And also like the relationship between freedom and right. It's not uh, so easily clear, right? You know, perhaps in a kind of you know, classical liberal sense, you could say, you know, maybe there's like a little bit of a political comment here, um, but it, it's also not as easy, you know, or as simple as a connection as you'd expect in a poem like this. I love thee purely as they turn from praise, right? I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs right now, finally, you know, constructing something of value out of this, um, you know, out of that old melancholy that the, the, the sonnet sequence begins with. Right. We're no longer so caught up on that, on that here, even if we have little references to this here and there. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that's about as much as I say uh, about this poem. You probably have more. Yeah. yeah, a couple of quick thoughts. So first of all, the, the repetition, this is the most intensely repetitive poem by far of the whole sequence. So mm -hmm. she uses the phrase, I love thee nine times in 14 lines. Um, if you include, I shall but love thee better after death uh, in the final line. So uh, it's quite clear that she's more than happy at this point to be completely explicit and open and as declamatory as possible with, mm -hmm. with her love. This has almost a Whitmanian feel to it in the, in the octet, you know, the, the first octet. Um, and I think it's interesting, you know, let me count the ways, but then she doesn't actually count them. I think mm -hmm. that's a nice touch. You know, it's, it's almost like, a little to the side, you know, I could count the ways if I wanted to, but let me give you these, these ideas, uh, the, the manner of, of it instead. Um, I, I, and my couple of last thoughts on this would be number one, I think this is probably the most famous poem because frankly, it's probably the most easily understood mm -hmm. in the entire sequence, or I'd put it in the top few. Uh, you do not have to be a, a super adept reader of poetry to read this and get something out of it. Right. And, and have something that you could relate to your own life and, and feelings toward those that you've loved. Um, so I, I think it goes down easy in comparison to some of the others we've highlighted or maybe mm -hmm. all the others we've highlighted. Um, I also I don't think it's particularly strong, to be honest. I think the octet is very good. The beginning, I think it falls apart in the in the sec, uh, the sestet at the end, right? If you read, if you read the last six lines of this poem just by themselves, I love thee with a passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. I mean, I, I think it's okay at best. Um, so, uh, others would probably, I'm sure, disagree with me about that, but I, I think that there's at least enough ambiguity and mystery and also uh, grandeur in the first eight lines to mm -hmm. make those very compelling. Uh, I think she's what, what she's trying to do maybe with the final six is, like you said, go back to some of these major themes that she's pulled from throughout the entire sequence to this point, right? My old griefs, so my old melancholy. Uh, my childhood's faith, we, you know, call me by my pet name, right? We talked about that linking to her childhood. Um, what I seem to lose with my lost saints, you know, I, that is a, a little bit mysterious, at least, you know, I don't know exactly what she means by that. Um, maybe when she realized that people or, or so-called saints weren't really such, and, you know, she, she loses some of the naivete associated with putting people on a pedestal or even with religion directly, uh, who knows, but, um, and if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death, you know, kind of hinting at maybe eternal life together in heaven. So, you know, I, I think it's okay. Um, probably it's just a preferential thing for me. Cause it's like, it's just so kind of, uh, touchy feely in a way, you know what I mean? And it's like, I, I, I like by far her poems better where she's much more intricate with what she's, what she's saying and how she goes about it. But um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say on this one. Yeah, I, I agree in terms of the, the, the final like two and a half lines. Uh, th this gets too close to the kind of like, you know, um, hokey, somewhat predictable territory, yeah. right? Like I shall but love thee better after death. 
like if God, you know, if God choose, right. Um, you know, like, like just operationally, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's a little bit predictable. Uh, this is, you know, in, in phrasing, it's a little bit similar to we, we, you get from earlier poems, but you know, it's not, it's not the whole like set that breaks down here. I mean, um, even like, I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs, right. This, you know, the, the idea, like, again, like going back to this, like, you know, some people have this like love for melancholy. I also have like some love for melancholy, uh, um, and, and, you know, th this is a, a common enough thing and to ascribe, you know, like a passion to it, right. Kind of like really flushes out, you know, that kind of, you know, this perhaps even infatuation fixation that she has in her, her, uh, uh past and perhaps even present griefs. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and to, you know, to, to connect that to this, like it's, it's unconventional, uh, my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my old saints, this kind of goes back, I, th I think, like if you kind of you, you view it, um, you know, uh, as part of like those like sonnet units, right? With uh, "Call Me by My by My Pet Name," uh, some like allusions to to that, perhaps. And yeah, I, I agree, it's a little bit of mysterious here, but I think that lends more credibility to what she's saying rather than not. But I do agree that the last two and a half lines, uh, the mm -hmm. things really uh, do kind of like break down here because I I just don't see that you know there's there's nothing really going on in terms of inversions right i love thee with the breath small tears of all my life right and if god choose right again like you know it's 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 it gets kind of conventional here yeah. um you know uh but i i think overall though there's enough going on here that this you know i would consider this like a minimum like an excellent poem right um even if there's uh some issues at the end but um also like imagine like like even if this was like a great poem uh, th th as an ending, this would not be the proper ending to the sonnet sequence, right? Because mm -hmm. the the whole kind of like idea behind the sonnet sequence is uh, this this complication of love, right? And this kind of you know this marrying of melancholy to the love and all these other things that she's doing, which is why you know um, this choice that she makes to end the sonnet sequence like this. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that this is uh, not only a, a great poem, right, but this is a great ending. And it, like we said earlier, this harken back to to the opening. Right. And structurally, the opening is a true opening. Structurally, the ending sonnet is a true ending to the sequence. Um, yeah. Do you, do you want to read this or? Yeah, I can read this. Yeah. So uh, final sonnet number 44. Beloved, thou hast brought me many flowers, plucked in the garden, all the summer through, and winter, and it seemed as if they grew in this close room, nor missed the sun and showers. So, in the like name of that love of ours, take back these thoughts, which here unfolded too, and which on warm and cold days I withdrew from my heart's ground. Indeed, those beds and bowers be overgrown with bitter weeds and rue, and wait thy weeding. Yet here's elegantine, here's ivy. Take them, as I used to do, thy flowers, and keep them where they shall not pine. Instruct thine eyes to keep their colors true, and tell thy soul their roots are left in mine. So, yeah, I think uh, to your point, the... Um, I mispronounced Eglantine, by the way. I guess that's a plant name. Uh, and, and wait thy weeding it. Here's Eglantine. So, um, yeah, I think to your point, if, if she had tried to end it with 43, it would have been um, just, just too overt, kind of too, um, too mawkish, whatever you want to call it. But here we get this nice um, sort of, summary we also similar to 43 she's tying in some prior themes um for sure but you know she also is is doing a nice job kind of helping the reader picture um where she is now but how it's still s similar but a more mature place than where she's been um so you know she talks about her beloved having brought her many flowers plucked in the garden and he's he's done this all the time right so through summer but also through winter 
and they grew in this close room and didn't miss the sun and shower. So they, you know, what he gave to her, she was able to make the most of even just in her little room there. And so similarly, in the like name of that love of ours, take back these thoughts, which here unfolded too, and which on warm and cold days I withdrew from my heart's ground. So, um, you know, that is probably speaking directly about the words they've exchanged together as people in a relationship, but also I think she's speaking pretty clearly about her poems there Mm -hmm. and uh, what she drew out of her heart's ground to give to him. Indeed, those beds and bowers be overgrown with bitter weeds and rue and wait thy weeding. So, you know, she's still saying it. There, there's plenty more to me that I know needs needs to continue to be sifted through, right? And, and she's counting on him to do some of that. Yet here's Eglantine, here's Ivy. Take them as I used to do thy flowers and keep them where they shall not pine. So she gives him something back. You know, it's her own plants. They're not flowers as well. Uh, there's something different. They're unique to her, but keep them where they shall not pine. Um, so I think it's an interesting phrase, you know, um, uh, to me, it's, 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 a, it's her way maybe of saying, you know, keep them for yourself. They don't need to pine for me or, or to get back to where they came from. Um, you know, I pulled these out and they are for you. So, so keep them there. Mm-hmm. Instruct thine eyes to keep their colors true and tell thy soul their roots are left in mine. So it, it is still connected to me, but they're, they're really for you. So, um, I, yeah, I think this is a, it's a pretty poem, you know, with some nice, nice imagery, uh, maybe veers a little close to being somewhat trite with like all the garden and, and plant imagery and metaphor that we've, you know, <laughs> poets have used forever. But um, what are your thoughts there? as, as um, an well, I, I actually don't think it's tried. I think I think uh, the opposite. Um, and uh, it, uh, part of the reason why I, I think the opposite is because I view this poem as a little bit a little bit darker than uh, maybe your interpretation. Um, okay. So, so like for example, get a beloved thou hast brought me many flowers, plucked in the garden all the summer through and winter and it seemed as if they grew in this close room nor missed the sun and showers uh this uh close uh you know it's it's it this this word is very near uh the word closed right you could imagine like a room without air right a room without light a room without water and yet there's still this kind of uh growth that's happening irrespective of of those facts right um and if it's irrespective of those facts, it means like, well, what exactly are these like flowers? Right. And, you know, we, we, we're, we're supposed to think of the flowers as like thoughts or like, you know, bits and pieces of like love, like whatever, however, however you want to interpret it. Like, it's kind of like a, I think along that axis somewhere. Um, And, you know, like what are they judging against exactly? Like what, what, what was happening that has, you know, uh, prevented them from like fully perhaps like uh, flowering, Right. It seemed as if they grew in this close room nor missed the sun and showers. Um, but here, like it, it gets like I think it gets even like this is just by implication, but it does get, I think, a little bit darker. So in the like name of that love of ours, take back these thoughts which here unfolded too. Uh yes, like this could very well be a reference to uh uh the poems that she's writing. I, I think that's true. Um it could also be like when you think of like take back. This isn't really a phrase that you would use in some sort of like gift exchange with a lover. There, you know, like even if you can technically do so, take back also has this feeling of a command, like take that back. Don't you say that, mm-hmm. right? Take back these thoughts which here unfolded too, and which on warm days and cold days I withdrew from my heart's ground, right? Um, I it, it's almost like given the context of like everything that she's talking about in the entire sonnet sequence, it does feel like first of all, you know, even if they love each other, they definitely seem to be you know prone to at least some kinds of arguments, right? We had that sort of made out explicitly earlier on, where she was like, "Listen, you know, um, we're walking through this place. I understand it's beautiful." I'm not smiling. I'm not happy. You're smiling. You're happy. Don't 
oppress me with your demands that I have to be happy 24 seven simply because, you know, in your mind, this moment is so perfect. We know there is this, you know, as a, as, as characters, right. There's characters in these poems. We know that they have like some, some tensions going on. And I definitely, you know, uh, read in some of these tensions and, e you know, even like further, right. Indeed, those beds and bowers be overgrown with bitter weeds and rue, right? So on warm days and cold days, right? She's withdrawing flowers that are kind of overgrown in some way, right? Imp imperfect in some way. And wait thy weeding, right? Here's eglantine, here's ivy. Take them as I used to do thy flowers, right? She's These are weeds, right? She's saying, take take these weeds, take the ivy weed, take the eglantine weed, right? Take my weeds as I took your flowers. There's almost a kind of inequality here. Mm -hmm. Maybe you, maybe as characters, she's taking like some blame maybe for some of the tensions and, and arguments that they might be having and keep them where they shall not pine. And where would, what would these weeds pine for? Right. right. Would they pine for that same old melancholy that she's referring to again and again, which seems to be like a point of tension, right, in their relationship? Is there something else going on? Instruct thine eyes to keep their colors true. The colors of what? And so instruct your eyes to keep the color of those weeds true. Not because, you know, these weeds in and of themselves necessarily will have their colors stay. Not because necessarily, you know, these uh, weeds are like so beautiful in the colors, but you, knowing that you have this love, use this love perhaps as a lens to view these interactions, to view perhaps some of the more unhappy moments. Force your eyes to keep these colors true against even, you know, some, some reality perhaps, right? And tell thy soul their roots are left in mine. You know, I, I do think there's a little bit of a, of a darker, not darker in the sense that this is like, you know, a bad relationship or this is something that, that cannot work out. But I definitely think, uh, you know, like, like there, there, there's, le you know, this other one with a little bit more of a trite ending, you know, there, there's more, like if, if the sequence would end in this way. Um, even if this were a great poem, like it's just it's just too comfortable and too neat of a resolution. And here we ha we definitely get a resolution, and um, but but it's not it's not a neat resolution. It's a resolution that refers back to all the kinds of issues and the melancholies that she's referring to. And I mean, and I, I think this line is so wonderful, right? Instruct thine eyes to keep their colors true, right? It's 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 something that subjectively has to happen. It has to come about. You know, it has to be willed in some way, right? So anyway, uh, I mean that that's just the way that I that I took this ending, and and why you know why I not only consider this a great poem, but this is a this is the perfect kind of ending to the to the sequence mm -hmm. yeah all good points and uh, i think maybe the last thing i would say is um she made a really good decision to not in any way pull directly from say sonnet number one yeah i think it you know it would have been an easy choice to be like well let's make sure it's nice and symmetrical mm -hmm. let me uh, talk about theocritus again or let me talk about dear and wished for years or, or how my years have changed and you know i have a different perspective on what i would call those years i mean it, you know anything she could have done that way and instead we just get one final poem with its own setup its own images its own feeling and it it seems like um you know a, a, an interesting direction that the reader can then extrapolate about where her life and their relationship is going to continue to go yeah but uh but but that was smart on her part um you know and and interesting how we go from like especially the final few lines of sonnet number one with that you know grand kind of violent imagery of uh, mm -hmm. love grabbing her you know and, and pulling her back by her hair and she realizes it's not death but it's love and and then here this is just kind of like a even though like you said there's some darkness to it or whatever it, it still feels like the work of a person in midlife who's kind mm -hmm. of in her study thinking about some things that have happened lately in her life and her relationship and you're taking a, 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 a an excellent poet's tack on that so mm -hmm. um you know smart decision on her part 
Yeah. And, and one more thing in my notes, I actually don't have it as strong. Like the idea that this is exp- explicitly talking about the, the, the weeds or I take them as I used to do thy flowers. In my notes, I, I wrote that it, it could very well just grammatically and also just in other senses be a reference to flowers as well as to weeds, right? Which is, you know, I think that's even better, right? In terms of keeping that tension going. Um, is, is there anything else that uh, we can say about Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Sinus from the Portuguese, um, before we close out? I, I think I've, I've said what, what I have to say. Certainly recommend it to, to anybody to read through wonderful sonnet sequence um don't don't know you know if you're maybe a a early days or more beginner reader of of poetry and sonnets i don't know that this would be somewhere you want to start necessarily Mm -hmm. because i think there is enough complexity that we've highlighted that you you probably need some maturation in your ability to to read and uh and, and really kind of understand what's going on but um you know her her uh her effort here was was excellent and um you know bears a, a, a fresh revisitation i think in in modern times so i'm glad that we've talked about it yeah i mean i, I i've uh considered uh barrett browning to be one of my favorite poets for a long time but i never really did much on her and i was like you know might as well just do it now do mm-hmm. aurorally uh later on in the year um but yeah i i c- concur with this uh, analysis um, so thank you guys for watching. This has been artifact number 19. Again, we are available on, uh, all your podcast apps. So Google podcasts, Apple, Spotify, all of that. You could listen to those shows on that. If you're listening on the podcast apps, you could also find this on our YouTube channel. That is automatic nation. It will be available in the show notes. So you could actually uh, view this discussion and see our faces as we talk about all this. Um, I, and we'll be getting back, uh, in, at the end of September, Joel and I with, uh, a show on photography, right? Joel is also a photographer as well. So, um, I'm going to let him sort of lead that show to sort of let the, uh, uh, kind of, you know, everything that we're going to cover, he's going to, he's going to select that for us. And, um, hopefully we'll, we'll have a good show. Thank you guys for watching. If you haven't hit like, please do so. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. And we'll see you again soon. Perfect. Thanks everyone. Oh my God.